Okay. All right. Good evening. Okay, so I just want to let everybody know. I think Doug may have mentioned we did just come out of executive session where we were covering uh, some personnel issues as well as security. No. All good evening. Sorry about that technical uh, delay here tonight. Uh, first item on our agenda: graduation. Um, want to thank everybody for uh, their patience with graduation. It's always um, iffy with weather, and so looking at the forecast. Uh, on that Friday night when we were to have graduation, it was a 50-50 at the time we had to make a decision whether it was going to rain. So we opted to push things off to Saturday and we ended up getting a beautiful evening on Saturday. And I believe probably the most people I've ever seen um, at a graduation. So we're um, thankful for that and wish the class of 2022 the best of luck. Which leads me to the future calendar. <clears throat> We've already approved the school calendar for next year, but I, I uh, We'll be coming back to you at some point, um, either July or August, to make a revision regarding graduation. And so what made it challenging this year was um, just the lateness. And then again, we're on the uh, Memorial Day weekend. And so what we're looking at is creating some makeup opportunities. Historically, we've um, wanted to have graduation on a Friday, but I want to think through and come up with some options so that. Um, we can kind of get out of that in the future of, of bad weather related to when the makeup would be. And so stay tuned. I just want to give you a heads up that I'm going to come up with a couple options for you to consider, uh, given, given all the feedback we've had as well. And also historically, Memorial Day weekend is always the state championships and track and field as well. So stay tuned for that. I just wanted you to have a heads up. Uh, June 28th is our buildings and grounds meeting. And obviously, like we've been doing, if we have items, we could certainly have that meeting, but we'll just wait to see if we have things that come up um, related to uh, that could go on a buildings and grounds agenda. Okay, moving on to the agenda. Personnel. A number of items so you can see in personnel A1, A and B. Um, we do have a um, resignation for first grade and then announcement of a retirement for uh, Ms. Jaworski. And then 2A through D, um, our recommendations to fill our um, openings that we had um, as a result of, of some retirements and resignations. And we're really, really pleased. I'm um, filling some really tough positions um, uh, across the school district. And so we're passing to all of you, the um, files for each of those recommendations. Then 3A and B are some support staff recommendations. And so um, we're, we're slowly, from, let me back up, from the professional staff standpoint, um, given uh, Ms. Gutschall's resignation, we, have, we do not have uh, that one posted or filled. We are going to take a look at our enrollment and want to uh, review that first before we proceed and move forward. Um, or what we do with that position. But A, B, C, and D of two um, have really filled all of the other professional openings. Uh, four, um, we're looking to employ Matt Carlson as a mentor for our recommend, recommendation for middle school music. And then five is the list of um, extracurricular um, contracts. That would be athletic and non-athletic, a number of folks. And the reason we put that now is a number of, of programs do work over the summertime and they'll start doing that. So we like to have those in, in place um, now. Six is um, some more additional help for summer custodians. And so here's three um, recommendations. And then seven is a list of folks um, to put on the uh, district athletic game help for next school year. Eight, um, we're rescinding a couple uh, STEAM camp recommendations that you previously approved. And then nine fills out the remaining uh, positions for the STEAM camp and the uh, high school program um, with Carrie Garvin. Ten, again, complementing the extracurricular contracts are a number of volunteers for a variety of, of uh, sports um, you can see those uh, recommendations to approve the volunteers. Other agenda items going back, we do not have a uh, presentation um, this month. 
B, we do have um, recommendations for LIU supply bids that have come back um, from the IU. Mr. Peart, do you have anything to add with that particular item? No, this is just standard this time of year is when we approve these. Um, nothing, nothing further to add. Okay, letter C, these are all the state contract purchasing um, consortium, so to speak. So we just seek approval to use them as we see fit. So when we go out for pricing, first things we ask vendors, are you CoStars, are you PEPM? Are you on one of the uh, purchasing uh, agreements for, for the state? And then this allows us to purchase directly from them. They've already been bid publicly. So it's been a, a quite a benefit to the school district. These are recommendation of a school dentist. And then E, we will talk about later in the agenda. Just for clarification purposes, um, we've put on the, obviously we'll be voting on a budget, but to make sure everybody's on the same page and we'll talk about it later. Option A is the index, option B is halfway, and option C is none. So um, we wanted to put all of those out there. Letter F, cafeteria lunch prices. Mr. Peart is going to talk about that later on in the agenda. Letter G are the amounts for the 22-23 federal programs that we've received. H, school insurance, Mr. Peart. So this is the um, school insurance for the students uh, if they so choose to take. Um, the highlight here is we it was an increase of less than $100, which in today's world is mm -hmm. Great. Um, we got the same coverage for just a just under a hundred dollar increase. So very pleased with that. And the next um, district wide insurance policies, you want to add to that as well? Sure. Um, more good news along the way as far as the um, increase that we've seen. Um, traditionally, um, it's been at least a five percent increase uh, on our insurance. Now, this insurance is our property, general liability, school leaders, cyber, um, crime, auto, umbrella, and then the workers' comp. Uh, that's what this item is dealing with. Um, so again, this is a 2% increase uh, from the current year to next year, uh, which is fabulous. Uh, again, given what the industry is looking at, um, you're looking at easily a 7% increase uh, average. Um, the biggest uh, factor that limited it is that the workers comp actually came down uh, because of our experience modifier. And that's what drives the uh, workers comp rate. Um, last year, the experience modifier was 1.045. This year it's 0.819. Basically one, one is the uh, middle of the road. Uh, so you obviously want to be below that. Um, and it's all based on your experience um, over the past three years. So if there was any injuries, worker, worker comp injuries over the last three years, they stay with you um, for renewal purposes. Um, so we're trending in the right direction. So overall, this is great news. Again, a 2% uh, increase. Um, so any questions, let me know. Justin, can you, what else is covered by the commercial policy that's just cyber crimes? Or? No, no, no. So all, all of it included is um, property, general liability, um, school leaders, uh, E&O, that's basically, that is correct. Yes. So Mr. Peart, if you just want to work through items J, K, L, and M. Sure. Um, so J, K, and L, are all change orders related to uh, the middle school project, new middle school project. Um, as you can see, uh, J is to ECI and it's a combination of five um, change orders uh, for the net deduct or credit of $2,396. Uh, so the first one, is an add of 6,393 uh, for the installation of window film in the gymnasium. Um, the glare that comes into that gymnasium is very severe. Uh, so we're looking to reduce the glare. Um, that's the cost for that. 
Um, the change the outside paver color uh, was that 2,180. And then the deletes uh, were to delete roller shades in the media center. As you can see, that's $4,505 reduction. Um, delete the washer, dryer, and water softener in the kitchen area. Um, we had already purchased those ourselves, so they didn't need to be part of the contract. So that's a de decrease is $3,434. Um, and then to delete the glass film on the gu guidance area windows, uh, that's a delete of $3,030. So overall, it's a uh, deduct uh, change order of $2,396. The uh, letter K is for uh, our electrical contractor, Lobar Incorporated. And this is what we've talked about uh, for a couple months related to the power to all the garage doors. Um, so this is actually under the amount that we were thinking it was gonna be. Um, so the total change order came in at $4,442.90. And the last one, uh, letter L, is related to our plumbing contractor, Rodney B. Smith. Um, and this is to address an issue. Uh, there was water hammering. So basically it was when the water came on and because the water comes down from the high school into the middle school, uh, with that process, there was a lot of vibration uh, that was causing issues. Um, so to address that, um, we're installing a combination air valve uh, in the amount of $3,827. Any questions on the change orders? Okay, um, letter M, this is related to both the um, completion of the new middle school and the work that is to be done at the old middle school. Um, before we had a um, site improvement bond that we were required to have, uh, for Huntington Township, um, and that was in the amount of over $25,000 that we paid for that bond. Um, now that the, the majority of the work has been complete, they are willing to let us not have to get a site improvement bond, which saves us a tremendous amount of money in return to get a letter of credit, um, which allows us to stay meet their requirements but at a much cheaper uh, cost. So what this does, um, as you can see there, the requirement is uh, from the township for satisfactory installation and completion of the erosion and sediment control, storm drainage and paving improvements um, related to the old and new middle school project. Um, so I've been working with the township, uh, the dollar amount that we're required to have right now is just short of $110,000. Um, so as part of the process that the bank requires us to do, um, we have to go through this and it has to be in the minutes. And it also authorizes me to sign on behalf, uh, to sign the loan, they call it loan documents, um, uh, for the school district. Um, but it's the bottom line is we're saving money by going this route than having to go through the site improvement bond, which is a much, uh, more expensive process. Thank you. <clears throat> letter N, we will talk about later in the agenda. Letter O is in agreement with River Rock. Um, the reason this is on there, um, at times we have to place students um, with River Rock as per board policy, or we, um, it just, uh, River Rock is better able to meet the needs of our students. And so this agreement kind of locks in what that rate will be. In the past, we've purchased seats um, we're not at that point. We don't have that consistency. So what this does is establishes a rate per day uh, for elementary students and secondary students. So it's our advantage to enter into the agreement. So if we do need it, we know exactly what the rate will, will be. Okay. And then letter P is the result of the presentation you saw two months ago from Mr. Boyce or Dr. Boyce and Mr. Carlson regarding the uh, music overnight trip. So we now have that um, official recommendation from the high school administration, and we're seeking your approval so that our uh, music department can take that trip next year. Okay, now we will go to finances. Mr. Peer. 
Okay, uh, starting with the general fund, we had a beginning balance of $7,112,705.86. We had revenue for the month of $3,021,263.80. We had payroll expenditures of $1,093,763.81 and other expenditures of $1,078,737 leaving an ending balance of $7,961,468.85. Looking over the revenue um, for this time of year, it's very standard. If you have any specific questions, please let me know. And then on to the expenses, um, again, our higher dollar amounts are our contracted services, our utilities, and our cyber charter schools. Um, if you have any specific questions related to um, the expenditures, please let me know. Okay, uh, moving on to the cafeteria fund. We had a beginning balance of $156,115.64. We had revenue of $172,614.37. We had payroll expenditures of $46,716.78 and other expenditures of $55,523.51 leaving an ending balance of $226,489.72, factoring in the federal and state reimbursement for May, we're at $346,508.67. Um, looking at the revenue uh, for this month, um, the only outlier is, uh, you'll see that it's the second revenue Line item, it's $37,740.57. That's part of the COVID money that we've received, uh, the supply chain assistance. That's the only outlier that's new uh, for this time of year. If you have any other specific questions on the revenue, please let me know. And then on to the expenses. Um, again, very standard. Um, the, the outliers, uh, the variative amount that is for a floor scrubber that we've now there's one in each building uh, to clean the kitchen floors. Uh, the CyberSoft technology that is a new new POS system that we are installing uh, for the start of next school year. Um, and the Singer equipment that is a food processor uh, for the high school. If you have any other specific questions, please let me know. Okay, uh, moving on to the capital reserve fund. We had a beginning balance of $843,978.53. We had revenue of $117,597.24, and we had expenditures of $46,893.44, leaving an ending balance of $914,682.33. The revenue, um, we, we received our money from our auction from the old middle school. Uh, that amount was $117,499.26. And the rest of the revenue was interest earned. Um, the expenses for the month, um, this was our sonic wall um, with the increase in our bandwidth that we're doing over the um, summer here for the start of next school year. Uh, the current um, firewall that we had in place did not, we needed to upgrade it to be able to handle the increased bandwidth. And that's what this charge is. Moving on to the construction fund, we had a beginning balance of $4,489,478.18. We had interest revenue of $1,732.10.
We had expenditures of $69,184.79, leaving an ending balance of $4,422,025.49. Looking at the expenditures, um, they're all related to the new middle school project. If you have any specific questions, please let me know. Okay, uh, last but not least is the scholarship fund. We had a beginning balance of $25,699.09. We had interest revenue of $2.17, and we had scholarship expenses of $3,969.81, um, leaving an ending balance of $21,731.45. <clears throat> Expenses are listed there um, for all the scholarships and the, that were awarded. And then obviously we needed some deposit slips as well. Thank you. <clears throat> now looking at consent agenda items, we can do our fund reports. And then under personnel, A, 1A, and B. Two is a no, three is a no, four, no. Um, five is a no, six is a no. Seven can move to consent. Eight can go to consent. Nine is a no, and 10 can go to consent. Letter B is a no. Letter C can go to consent. D, Dennis can go to consent. E is no. F is a no. G is a no. H, I, J, K, L, M, N is a no. Uh, letter N can go to consent. O is a no. And the high school trip can go to consent. Yep. Um, okay. Question about the school dentist. Do yes. We currently have one. Yeah. Yes. And, and so they, each year we have to approve a dentist, and I think this is a change um, from the person that we had this year. Yep. Include it in the budget, and yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Next item is um, a review of the bids we received from uh, the old middle school project. If you recall, we went out to bid um, previously, they came back extremely high. So we significantly revised the um, bid process. And so we had the opening on Thursday. So Anthony Colstock from Crabtree is going to review the uh, bid results. Just to clarify, when you said you revised the bid process, you mean the scope? Scope, scope significant. Okay. okay. <laughs> so the, the first, the first, first yes. yes. The first, um, we were trying to uh, do selective uh, demolition and renovation of the old building. And uh, this time it was a complete uh, demolition of the old building and the uh, completion of a new structure. So, Mr. Colstock. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Um, as Dr. Hotchkiss mentioned, last Thursday, we had a rebid for the middle school project and the <clears throat> support um, lack of facilities for the stadium. If you recall, this project was originally bid in um, early March, and that scope uh, included a partial demolition of the existing middle school with renovations to the existing team rooms. Um, also a, a support um, space for training uh, for some coaches. And then we also had the ad alternate for the daycare and base bid included uh, keeping the gymnasium and the auxiliary gym. Uh, with those bids being so high, what we did was we redesigned the project in an attempt to bring it in within your budget of 3.2 million. Uh, we proposed to completely demolish 
the existing school and in its place build a small block building uh, that would house the lockers, the team rooms. Uh, also with um, an official's room, uh, toilets for those locker rooms, and then also a team room for um, any of the uh, athletics that were using that space. From the information that we received from the first bid, based upon what their costs were, we budgeted approximately um, $1.5 million for the site work and the total demolition of the school. Um, then we took the difference of that money from your budget, which even though 3.2 is your total budget, we estimated about 2.7 to 2.8 just for construction. That way that you can leave um, some cost for potential unforeseen conditions during construction, testing and inspection that's required, and then any municipal approvals. Um, with that difference, we were able to determine a size of this locker room and roughly about 5,000 square feet. So it, it is not large and it is very bare bones. We even included and add alternate um, to go to a full masonry envelope. So the base bid was just a single wife construction, which means that you would have to winterize it um, during the off season. And then we had this add alternate um, for a full uh, masonry envelope where you would not have to winterize it. So when it was designed, it was very uh, cut and dry. We were really trying to bring it in on budget. Unfortunately, last Thursday, that was not the case. Uh, some of the feedback that we've been getting from contractors is with the recent fuel prices going up. Um, diesel right now is about $6 a gallon. You can imagine that contractors are concerned with potential price increases. This project is very site heavy, so that means a lot of site equipment um, is going to be needed. Um, this duration is going to go into next year. So uh, one, some of the feedback that we got was that while we were budgeting 1.5 million based upon March's numbers, some of the site work and, and demo for the school was coming in at over $2 million. So that means there's been about a 30% increase in that construction site development cost since then. So if you just look at the, um, the bid tabs, I put a summary sheet together to show you the, uh, the four low bidders for each trade. For general construction, unfortunately, we only received one bidder, but for the other trades, for mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, I think that we got uh, some pretty good participation. And then you'll see that I included um, what we were estimating for the construction budget to be about 2.8, and you see now we're about 1.1. The pages after shows the bid tab for, uh, for each of the trades, and then the alternates uh, for the trades that did have an alternate, and then the uh, unit costs that they were included um, in their bid as well. So what we are suggesting that you do tonight is not to reject the bids, not to accept the bids, but allow us some time to do a post-bid assessment with the contractors and do some value engineering, similar to what we had to do with the middle school. So we've already been in uh, contact with um, all the low bidders. Uh, we've had some ideas and we've gone back to them and asked, hey, if we were to re revise this or change that, how much of a credit could you give back to us? And uh, Additionally, they also have some recommendations. They could come back and they say, well, if you eliminate these items, we think we can give you a credit of this amount. Now, we're, we're not changing uh, the scope for, for, the, uh, for the support uh, locker facility, uh, but some of the things that we've been discussing for um, the value engineering ideas with the site work includes um, eliminating the finished paving for the parking lot and eliminating the striping 
and eliminating some of the curbing or some of the sidewalks. Uh, a lot of that can amount up to some pretty significant dollars very quickly. One of the things though, that we have to do is have the civil engineer review those items that the contractor is suggesting and make sh making sure that it still meets the land development plan um, by the municipality. And there may be some other things that they're suggesting that might not be a, a best practice or may impact stormwater. There's potentially some things that would impact uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act that we want to avoid and make sure we're keeping it in, in the project. But if you allow us a little bit more time to review these numbers with the contractors, we would come back to you with uh, a value engineering credit amount. And we would like to do this fairly quickly. Uh, our specifications have that the contractors are to hold bids for 60 days. And you see the price increase that we've had just from March. We really want to act quickly on this and not put these low bidders at a disadvantage where the prices are going up. We want to make a decision quickly and then they could secure some of their subcontractors, secure materials, so they won't see a price increase um, in the next month or so. So is there any, any questions? Anthony, I have a question. You did some of the value engineering. Uh, maybe um, uh, yeah, it's just you're removing some of the stuff like finished pavement, sidewalks, striping. That seems like a lot. Those seem core to the project. What, what's, what does that look like then if we remove those? What's yeah, so I, some of the items, even though you may remove them from this project, they may be required to be installed at a later date through the land development plan. And that paving may be something that's that's a requirement because of the, the parking count re requirement. So that parking would almost be treated as like an overflow or a um, little chaotic with where people are parking um, without the designated spaces. So some of those things you may want to come back in a couple of years and then do the finished paving. Um, we, we want to make sure that we're, we're recommending items that you could potentially do some somewhere down the road. To get so that the middle school is removed. Yes. And then is it just a field then? There's no pavement or a type of pavement? Yeah, we're not paving, so there wouldn't be any pavement. No, no, the removal no, of the middle no school? finished paving. So the binder course would still be there. So it would be like this, the, the, the sub base for the paving. It's just not the finished um, top layer of pavement that would be installed. You'll still have a parking area the same size as what was planned. It's just the finished paving that would not be installed. My concern would be people driving their cars on this, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, you're talking about contractors and their prices going up in the course of 60 days. And we're talking about putting this off for a couple of years. I'm just worried about the prices now compared to then, as well as, you know, like you said, ADA wheelchairs are not always comparable, compatible with that kind of rocky terrain. <clears throat> How would that affect? Well, we would team? not want to impact um, any of the accessible routes. So those are things that we must maintain that they meet the ADA slope requirements. So that would, that would not change. But with, um, with not installing the paving, it, it wouldn't be unsimilar to, you know, when you're going down a road or a highway where you can tell they're getting ready to replace like the blacktop um, and it's, it is a little bumpy. That's essentially what the parking lot would be like. You can still drive over it. It's not like you're driving over stone or gravel. Um, it's just more of the course uh, sub base to uh, underneath um, the finished uh, smooth paving surface that you would see on the newly um, built parking lot or road. Think of a new development, and they don't put they want they don't want to put the finished coat top on until all the houses are built because of the construction trucks tearing it up. So it, it's, 
it's smooth enough that, you know, even somebody with a wheelchair would be able to, but that's what they're going to come back with. I'm assuming is this is what we're going to cut or value engineer out. This is what the savings is going to be. And this is how it felt falls in with our land development plan. As far as whether it's something that we are required to do at some point in the future versus something that may be a nice to have in the future. And then, you know, I'm assuming based on those items, you'll also get us an idea of, you know, not that if you could do this, I guess you wouldn't be here. You'd probably be making millions somewhere else. But what do we think the prices are going to do in the near to long term for some of these things? Like, you know, one would like to think diesel is not going to stay at six dollars a gallon forever. But one never knows. One thing I want to add, just like the middle school projects, um, even though we may present to you all these value engineering items, you don't have to accept them. You could, as a board, decide, no, we, we're fine with keeping that in the project and we would pay that money for it. So what would end up happening, just for those that weren't a part of the, uh, the approval for the middle school, we would get a letter from the contractors with um, some soft credit amounts and you would approve the project, move forward with the project. We would sign the, you would sign the contracts. And then those VE items would come in at a later date as credit change orders. And then they would be processed after you've entered into a contract agreement with all of those contractors. Okay, thank you. Anthony, I have no question. So just that after the value changes, we're left with the uh, demolition of the old middle school and then uh, unfinished type of payment and then the field house with the new locker rooms. Is that kind of what's left? There's still uh, some stormwater management. Um, there's some sidewalk. I don't, I don't know that all the sidewalk can be eliminated, but most of that area up there is gonna be converted into a parking lot for the stadium. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the locker room facility is only about 5,000 square feet. It's not that large. It's just a block building with an asphalt shingle roof. Um, it's right up against the, the existing fence into the stadium. There's a little bit of, uh, of a grass area, but not much. I think you or someone shared with us before, what's the cost of just the field house part of the project? Well, we budgeted about $1.3 million, which is approximately $250 a square foot. But until we get the, the total numbers from the contractors, we're not quite sure if that 1.3 is, is accurate. 1.3 to build the new field house. Yes. Okay. I mean, I think that what we need to do is give them the time to get the facts. To get us more details about- well, that's, what that's what they're gonna go back and do. What, so, I, yeah, so, what I'm concerned about though too is at least the plan right now doesn't sound attractive. Well, um, we don't know what it is. He's speculating and keep in mind, whatever they value engineer out, we can choose to say, no, we're gonna go ahead and, and we don't want that. We wanna we, we want keep that in. That, that's a decision we, without having numbers tied to it, really makes a difference of how, to me, how attractive anything is. Because, you know, if he came in and said, you know, we can, you know, we can not put the finished coat of the paving on and you're going to say $4 million. Okay, done. Right. But we know that's not the case. I mean, I mean, facetious, but, but let's get, let's get the data. And then we'll, you know, the, the, so I don't, do you remember when we went through this with the middle school? Yeah. I mean, we went through line by line and there was, there were things that we said, no, no, no. That's, we, we don't want to value engineer that out. But it, it seems, are there other alternatives maybe we want to look at then too? I know well, we have that's some, what they're going to give us. Something that maybe we want to discuss as an alternative then too. We currently have a plan that we're going to have for what's going to be happening this fall. Is something that too, that maybe we need to continue to We've already talked. I think they already have a plan for the fall. We, hmm? Yeah, yeah we've we talked, talked, we talked previously. We, we project or no project, we have to have alternate locker rooms, which we're going to be um, creating in the high school. 
Um, we have, uh, we're going to use in a couple things. More than likely, we're going to convert the auxiliary gym into some temporary locker rooms. We're going to be using the downstairs locker room because there's an external um, access point to get into the stadium. But all of, when, when they renovated the high school project that concluded in 2008, no support services or space for the high or for the stadium was included in this project. That's, that's why we're even having the conversation. So we're going to create some temporary situations to get us through until something is done in that space over there. And we, we've known that from, from day one, we would have to do something. Our goal was not to have to interrupt, but there's, there's no question we, we will. So we've been working with uh, coaches, athletic director, maintenance to uh, facilitate that plan. I guess then to my, my point is kind of in there too, is it sounds right now, if we want to continue, you know, continuing the value propositions to see what other numbers come back, I understand that prospect, but right now it sounds like we're going to end up with, um, I don't know, something less than ideal. So maybe there's other things that we can consider. Like if we use the money for the field house to build a proper parking lot with sidewalks and curbs and, and lines instead of a field house, it sounds like that might be a better alternative than having a subpar parking lot and a field house. I guess that would depend, but let, let's, let's let them come back with their data. And then, you know, that's, that's a conversation we'll, we'll have, but until we know really what we're up against. And then also, we also need to understand that you know, the impact of like the example you gave, what is the long-term plan? Because I don't think using the auxiliary gym is a long-term plan because that has other impacts on, on the day-to-day -day program. Well, it doesn't seem like we have a lot of good opportunities though too, because then the idea of an unfinished parking lot, then we have to hope that two or three years from now, we have different funding or a different source then to go back and finish the parking lot. Like that money's not gonna change or appear later. That's true. But at least it might be an item that you can kick the can down the road at a later date, rather than something that once you've made the decision, you can't go back on it. And I think that's probably, you know, when we evaluate the value engineering items, those might be the items that we would recommend, not something that, hey, you know, don't, don't take this and you've missed your one chance to have it. But if it's something that can be done at a later date, even though, as you mentioned, it is risky with the way construction costs are, but that's, that's a possibility. You could, and so could I, um, right? I mean, to me, actually, parking is a lower priority than the field house, than I, I, the locker room. Let's go, it's not a field house because that really conjures up some bad images. Everybody thinks of, you know, a college field house, you know, the swimming pool, weight room, you know, all that, but that locker room to me is, is probably the more pressing need because that's the reason we're in this whole conversation to begin with. If we didn't need the locker room, this, this conversation would be easy, right? But we, we need that space. We need it somewhere. So, but let them do their, let them do their homework. Uh, and then I, I think that that could even spur some other ideas of what we're willing to live with and what we're not. And the, you know, the question comes down to, we, we do want to live within the budget. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Myers, uh, item nine, emergency instructional time template. Um, so this is essentially a form that we have to um, provide to PDE in the event that we choose to implement a virtual instructional day uh, throughout the school year. So um, historically, we've never done this, but in the event that we wanted to use a virtual day in place of a snow day, this form would allow us to do that. It would allow us to um, use a virtual day uh, for a makeup day if we decided to do that. Um, last year, this this the only day that we ended up doing, I believe, that was virtually was our March day. So again, this form, submitting this form to PDE allows us the flexibility to implement a virtual day if we needed it. Thank you. And curriculum update. 
Um, short and sweet tonight. Um, my update tonight is just that we have um, signed a contract with the uh, company that I had shared, the Edmentum, which is offering the professional development for curriculum and also the curriculum platform. Um, I have organized a group of, of about 13 to 15 teachers who are going to be working with me this summer to um, establish a plan. We've um, created a tentative professional development plan for next year that involves um, all of the curriculum work that we've been talking about. Um, so right now, <clears throat> we'll get all of that started this summer and finalize some things. Hopefully, July, August, have an actual final plan that we'll be able to share out as far as next steps. Thank you. Next item, uh, courtyard. They did start working on the middle school courtyard. I got an email today that they're actually ahead of schedule. Um, they're actually to the point that they're already laying uh, large tile pieces. So um, we um, had one of our tech guys who has a drone took overhead pictures of the before. And so we're going to periodically take pictures, then get one when it's all um, all done as well. So I just wanted to bring everybody up to speed. And um, we're really excited about what the final outcome is going to be. And so far, everything is going well with the project. 22-23 lunch prices, Mr. Peart. Okay. Um, I know everyone's looking at the amount that's in the cafeteria fund and wondering, what are we doing with all this money? Um, so, I mean, COVID obviously caused a lot of problems in a lot of areas, but the one place that it wasn't a problem was on the cafeteria fund uh, and the balance that is in it. Um, the ability for all students to eat free uh, significantly increased our reimbursement. Uh, and you can see that in our balance in our cafeteria fund. Um, unfortunately, um, at this point, um, like I've said already, for the 22-23 school year, it's back to pre-COVID um, where lunches are based on um, families filling out applications if they qualify for free or reduced um, lunches. Um, that's the understanding we have. And unless something happens at the federal level, which does not seem likely at this point, um, that's the way it's going to be for moving forward. So as I had mentioned previously as well, um, the National School Lunch Program, which we are part of, is highly regulated from the federal level. Um, and one of the pieces that are regulate that is regulated is the lunch prices and breakfast prices that we charge. Um, every year we have to certify, um, we have the ability, as long as we have a positive balance as of December of the year prior, um, we, we have the ability to keep prices where they're at currently. Okay. We don't have to increase. Um, but there is a, what is called a paid lunch equity tool that we have to fill out. And the point when we get to that, we do not have a balance in our uh, cafeteria fund, which we've been there, um, recently in the last two years, we've been there. Um, we do not have a choice on what the school lunch prices are. We follow what the, um, tool spits out. We input data and it puts, it says what the price is and that's what we have to do. Um, so the, the risk is that we do not do anything. And at some point in the future, I, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball to say when we're gonna run out of money um, in the cafeteria fund, which then ultimately the general fund has to uh, take over. Um, that, that's, that's the risk you're taking. So I fully understand. I will give you an update in the fact that we are in the process uh, and have uh, orders placed for over $100,000 worth of equipment. Um, like I had mentioned for the elementary and high school, um, we have not done a significant uh, renovation of the equipment in those kitchens for a, I mean, ever since I've been here and prior to that, 
when Mrs. Sterling, who the director of food services, um, she's not been part of it either. And she's been here at least three years prior to me. Um, so it's been, it's going on 15 years uh, that we've not upgraded anything. Um, so like I said, we're like just over a hundred thousand dollars of items that are going to be placed uh, for up, upgrades uh, to provide more opportunities for better food, different, uh, different selections for students, um, which I think will benefit them all. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I don't think, I mean, you look at the number and obviously you're thinking there's no, there's really no reason to increase. Okay. Um, I can't dispute that, but I just want to throw it out that at some point, we do not want to get to a point where our prices are so low that we have to see a dollar increase in one year. Okay. Um, up pre COVID, um, and board members that have been on for a while, correct me if I'm wrong, but traditionally we've, I mean, we've been five cent increases, um, minimally, uh, I think one year we might've done 10 cent. Um, but, uh, currently our rates, uh, elementary breakfast is a dollar 45. Secondary breakfast is a dollar sixty. Elementary lunch is two twenty-five, and secondary lunch is two fifty. Uh, and the milk is fifty-five cents. Um, so I didn't know. I mean, we have to let PDE know by June thirtieth. So that's why the discussion is now, and then the approval for tomorrow is there. Um, but that's why it's being brought up. So I didn't know any kind of direction or uh, where the board was thinking or how, how you wanna move forward with this. Justin, do we have any idea of <clears throat> with food prices going up and if we were to hold, if we were to hold a line where, you know, do we have a swag on what we think the fund balance for the cafeteria fund would be at the end of next year? Um, that, that's, The, the challenge is this, um, because we've been supplemented by what you saw today. I mean, we got almost $40,000 in supply chain assistance. I do not see that going to be happening beyond this year. Um, so, you know, traditionally, um, the amount in the fund balance has been, a second. So like um, at the beginning of 21, 22, we had $63,000 in our account, okay? Um, I mean, it's traditionally been between that number and upwards of 80. I mean, it's always been below $100,000. Um, I feel fairly certain that at the end of next year with going back to pre-COVID that we'll be at that level for sure. Um, I think I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to maintain that beginning of 23-24. Um, so, you know, how much is food prices going to continue to go up? You know, I, I don't, unfortunately, it's like everything. We don't know. Um, but, you know, and I mean, all the, all the information we have, no, obviously no one increased prices because it didn't really matter during COVID because everything was free. Um, so there's no point in, I mean, free, it's free. Um, so, I mean, obviously we're not looking to make a profit by any stretch. We just need to cover our cost. Um, and that's, that's what we're striving to do. I mean, I would say if, if we didn't increase prices for next year, I think we'll be able, with what our balance is going to be, I think we're gonna be able to cover our costs without a doubt. It's just the risk of, like I said, when we hit that negative amount at some point, and I, again, I don't have a crystal ball to say when it's gonna be, that then we're gonna be forced to raise it to whatever that tool says it's gotta be. Justin, with that tool, yes. did you I'm happen sorry. to plug in our current information just to see where in we- the tool? Yes, where well, we would be it's, it's interesting, so, you know, with with the data that they're asking for, you can't even supply it because in COVID, 
we didn't even have to qualify for it. So again, heavily regulated from the government, but it didn't make any sense because we don't have the data to put it in, to spit out. Um, so, I mean, traditionally up pre-COVID, I mean, we were, I will say that the highest increase that we would have had to do was 25 cents. And for our board, that was significant because we've never, I mean, the highest that I ever remember is 10 cents in one year. And most of the time it's been five. Yeah. So, I mean, 25 cents in one shot, that was, that was significant. But I mean, with everything else that's rising, that 25 cent could be dollar real soon. So, you know, that's the best information that I have at this point. Um, but again, like I said, I, I feel confident that with our beginning fund balance and what we have, um, I think we'll definitely have enough to cover. I mean, I hope I'm not speaking incorrectly, uh, but again, I don't have the crystal ball to know how much, I mean, we know what our labor rates are gonna be. They're not gonna be significant. They're pretty standard uh, from, for the whole year. It's just those food costs, milk costs. Um, and we will adjust a la carte items. I mean, we do that. Uh, the board does not set those rates. You set the rates of the uh, breakfast and lunch prices, but the a la carte, um, that's, I mean, to be honest, that's where the district tries to make up some of the lost money on the breakfast and lunch. Just need a direction for where you you want to keep them the same. Are you thinking an increase for next year? Hey, Justin. I mean, my initial reaction is to just leave it the same. What does everybody else yeah. think? I agree. I think we should keep it the same. I yeah, agree. I tend to agree also. Uh, this is Corey. Right, Can you hear you. me? This is Corey. Can you hear me? All right, now we will. Before you. Yep. So, before we get into the discussion around our final budget, I, I do need to uh, mention that it's my, it was brought to my attention this evening that there's been uh, a document that's been floating around social media called Key Facts for the Bermudian Spring School District Budget. And I just want to be very clear that is not something that the board or the district produced. So, that if I know this, there, was, there was some confusion, people couldn't understand why the district would put that out there. They didn't. Um, our area for posting things will typically be our website uh, and, uh, and not Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or Instagram or TikTok or did I get them all? Close. So, okay, I have hardly any of those. So anyhow, um, I just wanted to make that clarification. Mr. Peart, I just made you co-host so you can take over. So as Justin is pulling up the uh, presentation, one of the things that you're going to see at the front was, uh, I know we have some, some new board members. We've had conversations about things we've done in the past. So uh, we've worked really, really hard since our last meeting to give you a tremendous amount of historical data, some that goes back 10 years, that tells the story of where we are today. Um, and so that's related to uh, the budget, to healthcare, to personnel, and so, Mr. Peart, we've incorporated that into the presentation, and I'll uh, turn it over to him. Okay. Um, so, like Dr. Dr. Hotch just mentioned, you know, I, I believe it's it's my role uh, in providing you as the board as much information that you need to make an uh, informed decision. Uh, obviously, budgets, uh, tax rates, all that is is the um, a very important thing that you have to do. Um, so I know I've presented a lot of information to you over the last five months, um, and I'm not trying to overwhelm you by any stretch. I'm just trying to provide you the information um, as well as some history behind some things that we've done up to this point. Uh, and this, this presentation is no different. So um, I apologize if I overwhelm you, but I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to provide you the information that you need to make an informed decision. Um, so as Dr. Hotchis just mentioned, um, this is a summary of going back to 2014-15, um, and there'll be more detail to come uh, throughout the presentation. 
Uh, but these first three slides are a summary of what has occurred over the last, um, from 1415 to current. So the, uh, the columns are gonna stay the same for the healthcare reductions, personnel changes, special ed uh, changes, uh, service delivery changes, and bond refinancing. That's gonna be the same columns on all three slides. So as you can see, uh, and again, the detail of what those numbers uh, are, are in later slides. But as you can see, um, and then there's a cumulative savings uh, column there as well. So like in 14, 15, you can see $233,291 um, savings in healthcare, followed by 15, 16 of 249, 532. So you add those two together, that's where you get the $482,000 number, okay? Cumulative. So we just keep adding to it every year. Um, so the main thing to see there is in the three years on that slide, the healthcare reduction savings was just shy of a million dollars uh, in those three years. We had some uh, bond refinancing that was done. The red, the red numbers are one-time savings, okay? Um, so that's, that's the significance there. Frozen again. Well, I'm that. Oh, okay, there we go. All right, um, moving on to uh, 17, 18, 18, 19, and 1920. Um, as you can see, uh, the healthcare reductions is um, cumulative over the those six years now. We're at 1.6 million. Um, personnel changes, um, and again, these uh, will be more highlighted later. Um, we don't know if we get into specifics, but you can see it by year. Uh, in these three years, $610,000 of personnel changes. Um, special ed changes um, that we've had, and that, that's along the lines of um, Schedule A or services that students um, need through the IU that we select um, the savings that we were able to, to generate there um, over those three years was $525,000. Um, and then the service delivery changes. Again, the, the detail of this uh, is in a little bit later, uh, but you can see over that it's 377,000. Uh, and the other big, big piece here in 1920 that I spoke about last month was the bond refinancing that we did a one-time savings of $1.3 million. And then this last slide of the, the historical summary um, shows uh, an additional uh, savings for healthcare. Uh, so over that um, nine year period, we saved just shy of $2 million in healthcare. Uh, personnel changes, uh, a savings of 1.3 million. Special ed changes, 794,000. Uh, and then service delivery changes at 454. And then the bond refinancing for that nine year period was 1.3 million. So a total grand savings of $5.8 million over, those, over the last nine years in those categories. So this is just a breakdown of how, um, and this actually goes back one year prior, um, of where the reductions uh, were and occurred in elementary, middle, high, and then the district. Um, it's just a breakdown to show you how, how that breaks out. Um, I think this, this is very important because I, this is more of the behind the scenes things that we do prior to bringing numbers to the board uh, that I think is important to see. Um, we work very closely with our insurance broker, uh, who has a great relationship with our insurance provider. Um, and as you can see through here, how much, how many millions of dollars are saved um, from the initial 
uh, contract that uh, our insurance provider has provided us. So the narrative um, is, it, you can get bogged down by that. I think what you, the best thing to look at is the CBC calculated without cap, okay? So that, what that number represents is if we did not negotiate contracts that have caps, and that means that no matter what our experience has been throughout the year, premium wise, we are capped at a certain percentage increase, okay? And we've worked hard with our insurance broker to establish those with currently Capital Blue Cross so that we don't have one year that we're having an increase of 40% and the next year we have 10%. We level it out so it makes it more budget neutral or we more predictable, okay? Um, so currently the cap we have in place for con our contract cap rate right now is 11.5%. Thank goodness we had that this year. We would be seeing significant, significant increases in healthcare. So we work hard on that to make sure that we can have some budget stability and predictability. Um, so, you know, 2014, if you can look, it would be 4.3 million if we didn't have the cap in place and it ended up being 2.7 because we had the cap. Um, 15, 4 million, we had the cap in place, plus we had some benefit changes, got it down to 2.9. Um, so I think, does everyone understand what the, what, what this is showing, um, and what, what we've done to try to limit our exposure as far as healthcare is concerned, because that is one of our main cost drivers, um, that we try our best to limit the exposure that we have. <clears throat> so. You know, 2013 um, will be our last year um, for the um, our three-year agreement. So we're you mean 2023, be... right? What did I you say? You said 2013. Oh, I'm sorry. 2023. <laughs> my fault. Yes. Um, so we need to obviously, if we have a good um, premium year uh, this year, that will be great. That will assist in the negotiation process. Um, but we will definitely be going towards uh, to Capital Blue Cross and starting that conversation with them very shortly here coming into the new school year so we can have predictability. Um, these next nine slides, I believe it is, um, this shows you more the detail on what the first three slides we covered, okay? So it also shows you what the index increase so that's the act one index um so the act one index here was 2.8 the final budget was approved at 2.0 okay um and there are the budget adjustments i wouldn't focus too much on the revenue and expenditures um but the adjustments that were made as you can see there uh medical insurance um and then we had a decrease in our tech prep tuition for that year so 15 16 the Act One index was 2.6, and that's what the final budget was approved at, 2.6. Um, as you can see, the adjustments, we had uh, payroll deduction uh, that reduced the cost of our insurance because we had an increase in our um, cost share, um, along with we had an increase in the um, basic ed subsidy as well as the special ed subsidy. Um, and then the ready to learn block grant um, was adjusted and our title, we had actually a reduction. So that increased our difference, if you will, um, because we lost revenue. 16, 17, again, the index was 3.3. The final budget was approved at the 3.3 Act One index. Um, as you can see here, some of the, I mean, we've talked about, I mean, you see a lot of reoccurring themes uh, that every year, but some other ones here, uh, more, I mean, less dollar amounts, but more subsidy related from the state. Um, and then there we had a savings from our open enrollment and that's dealing with our healthcare. So 
um, whether people decided to leave our plan um, or change uh, their, whether they went from family to two person uh, or whatever, that is the amount of savings we gained uh, throughout our open enrollment process. 1718, uh, the Act 1 index was 3.4. The final budget was approved at 3.4. Um, and this one here, you can see the Schedule A savings. That's our um, IU uh, special ed services that we um, have. It was a reduction of $175,000. Uh, we had some retirement savings from our salaries. Uh, and this year, we eliminated the late bus. We adjusted the tech prep budget and we eliminated driver's ed uh, as, a, as the district covering it. 1819, the Act 1 index was 3.3. The final budget was approved at 3.3. And then um, minor adjustments throughout the year uh, for, for that budget. 1920 was 3.1, the Act 1 index, and the final was approved at 3.1. Um, as you can see, uh, the only difference between here is um, we did increase because we increased our support staff salary matrix at $85,000. Um, and then there's showing your debt uh, refunding, uh, as well as we had some attrition uh, due to enrollment um, that we saved some money on salary and benefits as well. 2021. Uh, the Act 1 index was 3.6. The final budget was approved at 3.6. Um, and then you can see there the, uh, incre the, the changes that were made. It'd be great to say that for 22-23 decrease in fuel oil, but mm, I don't see that happen. 21-22, uh, the Act 1 index was 4.1. The final budget was approved at zero tax increase. Um, and then as you can see here, from the, uh, the adjustments that were made uh, throughout, the, throughout the year. And then 22-23, our Act 1 index is 4.7, and you will determine what the uh, final budget will be tomorrow night. Uh, but you can see the adjustments that have been made. Um, I think this is very important to point out because this helps explain, because um, I've been asked here in, in board meetings and. Uh, with uh, other meetings as well. Um, what caused the difference between our expenses and revenue? And I think these next couple slides will definitely hammer home uh, where a lot of the uh, discrepancies have come. So this is data that is state related. I mean, it's the entire state, uh, but we're not immune from this by any stretch. So as you can see, um, the amount of so the orange is the uh, special education support services. Um, so that's all your like aids and, and occupational therapy and things of that nature. Your special ed instruction, that's your, that's your teachers and uh, things related to teaching the special ed students. So that's, com that's, that's your expense, okay? That's your expense. And you can see the, the bar graph and how it just continues to rise. And then you see the blue line that goes across. That's the special ed funding that we receive from the state. There's a little bit of a discrepancy there. Um, so as you can see, we have a significant issue and we have $6 billion worth of expenses statewide and we're school to public school districts are getting 1.1 billion in revenue. Um, so, I mean, I think that speaks volumes. Um, again, piecers. So this gives you back from 1979-80 up to the projection for 2027-2028. And you can see how the, it just, I mean, it dips down. It was as low as 1.9, 1.09%, pretty much zero um, in 2020, 2001 to 2002. Um, and from all the projections that they're providing us, it's going up to 40% um, beyond, as you can see, as you get into 2030 and beyond, you're going to be up to 40%. And again, remember, for every dollar spent of salary, 
that's the amount we have to pay. We have no choice. That is mandated to us from piecers. We have to pay 40 cents. If it gets to 40%, 40 cents for every dollar spent. So this combines uh, those plus adds a little bit more. Um, so as you can see here, the mandated cost growth, and it only it focuses on three areas, three of the specific areas that I've been talking about for the last five months, for the last five years, because um, they don't change. Um, but I think this highlights it pretty clearly. You have the total pension cost, which is, now this is from 2010 to 2021, okay? So the total pension cost on the right-hand column is the gray area. The charter tuition cost is the yellowish color. And the special ed cost is the purple, okay? So that, for all three of those areas, it's $6.5 billion. The amount of state funding related to those areas Okay, is just shy of three million, two point eight billion dollars. Where's the rest of that fall? On the local level, because those areas, we don't have a choice as a school board, as a school district. We have no choice. We have to pay our piecers, we have to pay cyber charter schools, and we have to pay special ed costs. No choice. Again, I think this highlights it as best as we can. Um, so um, it's, it's not a pretty picture, um, but it's reality, okay? And you've seen this uh, slide before, but I just like to highlight it. Um, even though we had a reduction in our enrollment uh, for 21-22, our increase in costs for cyber have increased $200,000, okay, are projected to. Um, and the, those projections are still looking good. Um, they're still, we're still gonna be receiving bills throughout the end of June into July uh, that will come back to this year, uh, but that's where we're at. Um, and, it's, and it's a significant, significant issue. And it's not a school choice issue, it's a funding issue. So, now I'll move over into uh, information that um, you've seen already, but I think it's good to review. Um, so I'd just like to start off with, uh, because this is so new for this year, um, the fact that the Homestead Farmstead exclusion, uh, which is a direct credit to every approved uh, taxpayer, okay? Every approved taxpayer will receive, without doing anything, a $40.50 tax reduction automatically this school year. For the 22-23 school, their, your school tax will automatically have a $40.57 tax decrease. Okay? That's the first time since Act 1 has been invo uh, invoked in 2006 that that's been anything of significance. It's usually been $1 up or $1 down. It's been stationary. This is the first year. So a $40.57 decrease right off the bat, no matter what you do. So this, is, this information has not changed from the preliminary budget, okay? And I include that to say that that's, those figures are based off the Act 1 index tax increase, okay? Um, we'll get to the slide that shows whether you make the decision for the midpoint or you do the zero tax, what those numbers look like, okay? Um, again, highlighting here on the revenue, uh, we're just over 60% of our revenue budget will be locally funded. Um, and that's at the Act One index. So if you go, um, but it doesn't matter because we're, we're, you'll just be using fund balance. So it's gonna be over 60%. Uh, only 38.4% is state funded uh, and 1.76 is federal. Um, 
as you can see here on the expenses, expenses, this has not changed from the preliminary budget that you've seen. Um, the 500 level, um, that is where the cyber charter, transportation, any other tuition that we pay comes out of. Uh, that's where you see our most significant increase um, for this for for budget to budget, uh, 9.87. Um, and I'll just highlight that overall. Over 65% of our budget is salary and benefits. Over 65% salary and benefits. So here's the breakdown of the effect of how much fund balance each tax option provides. Um, so you'll be using at the Act One Index, it's 1.7 million. At the midpoint, it's 2 million. And at the zero tax increase, it's 2.3 million. Okay. And then here is the same information that you received in the preliminary budget. At the Act One index, this is what the projections show at this point. I'll just say right now, this is using information that I have at my disposal right now. Can that change? Absolutely, but I don't have a crystal ball. I'm using what I know right now, okay? Um, so at the Act One Index, we would have, our fund balance would be to 1.2 million at the end of next school year, uh, at, at the end of the 23-24 budget. Um, and then you can see a negative 2.1 at 24-25 and negative 6.1 at 25-26. Justin, can I ask a question real quick? For the 2024-25 right there, that two million, that's a deficit. So we haven't raised taxes. We're going to take from the fund balance or we'll have no fund balance. What, do you, what is that saying right there? That's saying at the end of the 23-24 school year, you're going to have $1.2 million left. And with the information I have right now, that's going to leave a 2.1 deficit in 24-25. Okay, thank you. Yep. And Justin, under your revenue assumption for 24-25, yep. did you have a tax increase at, um, kind of assumed in there? Yes. How much? Uh, 3%. Okay. Um, so here's the same uh, slide, but at a 2.35% tax increase. As you can see, that $1.2 million figure goes to 800,000, 887,000. So your, your um, deficit in 24-25 grows to 2.4 million. And then at a zero tax increase, it drops to 574,000 and your Deficit in 24-25 goes to 2.7 million. Um, the one thing I will, I'm trying, I want to highlight, okay. Um, the vote tomorrow, no matter what option is, is voted on, it's a two-step vote, okay. You must vote the same way on both steps. You cannot have revenue without the corresponding millage rate. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? So you're gonna vote on the revenue and expenses, expense numbers first. If you vote yes for that, you have to vote yes for the millage rate. You can't vote no to the millage rate because you gotta have the millage rate to generate the revenue figure. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. Um, so, With that, that's the information that we uh, had put together for, uh, for everyone. Um, again, I know it's a lot of information. I know over the last, since January, we've uh, provided tremendous amount of information. Um, but again, that's what I view my role as to provide as much information to have for you to make informed decisions. Okay, so as we reviewed the agenda for tomorrow, we have to give direction as far as 
what options do we want on the agenda uh, to vote on? Keeping in mind that it could change tomorrow because if what we put forward tonight as what your option, and it gets voted down, then we start all over again tomorrow night. So. First, if for comment or whatever, I just have a couple of things I wanna appreciate the presentation, everything. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm tracking everything. So I wrote down a couple of notes and did a lot of homework over the last uh, few weeks and definitely over the last couple of days. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong anywhere. This is just what I'm, I'm taking out of it. Uh, we've had more expenditures than revenue, right? In 2014, all the way up to 2021 from when I'm looking on the slides. I just want to make sure I'm reading that correctly. Um, right. That's just based off the information that you provided. Uh, we've raised taxes every year with the exception of 2021 um, to that one index. I didn't realize that until you said that on there. 14, um, 15, we did not either. That, that, okay. Yep. Um, but the fund balance continued to decline. Is that true? That information uh, was in last month's, but um, I have it right here. So the fund balance actually increased from 2012 through 2015, it reduced in 2015-16, it increased in 16-17, it reduced in 17-18 and 18-19, increased in 19-20 and decreased in 2021. Okay. That made me think of a couple more questions I'll bring up, I guess, later on, because um, there's something I am confused on then or you'll be able to clear it up, I'm sure. Um, another thing I'm tracking is from, I can see retirement and charter schools um, in the state only paying their 38.4% is the biggest contributor why um, possibly two years from now, we're gonna have a deficit, right? Um, and they're supposed to be paying 50%, correct? Does that sound right, the state? It, there, I mean, I can't, say exactly what they're supposed to be paying. They're supposed to be paying a lot more than what they are currently. What that actual percentage is, I don't know that. I, there, I don't think there's a finite number out there, but it's a lot less than what it's supposed to be. It used okay. to be up close to, closer to 50. So okay. we, we've seen constant decline in the percent that the state is providing. Right. Okay. So as, as they don't introduce additional funding at the state level, School boards have only one mechanism to make up the shortfall, which is the local. Which is the local, right? Okay. Now, the, the you, you know, but also let's not kid ourselves. We go back and ask the state, you know, to give us fifty percent. Well, you know, they're going to grab that money from somewhere, and it's going to be still us, right? Mm -hmm. Because the taxpayers, they get their money from the taxpayers also. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that you know, there's been a lot of discussion about. You know, for example, do we get rid of real estate taxes? And of course, that's been bantered around for decades. One of the things they introduced is that, well, then we'll just increase sales tax, which sounds relatively fair, except how do we know that, if you will, every dollar generated in tax revenue in Bermuda Springs School District is gonna come back to Bermuda Springs School District? Mm -hmm. That that so that you know, so uh, you know we, it's, I put that under the category of be careful what we wish for, um, because I would like to think we're a little bit better at you know kind of making sure the needs are met for the local district locally than in Harrisburg. Just my, you know my two cents. Okay, I just had two more points real quick. Um, as of this brief, again, the most current information, I realize that it changes, it can change next month and stuff like that. But um, our local community, which I didn't realize, because I had a different figure, I thought it was like 54.7% based off the slide, but with the other amounts coming in, with the, it's put on the local community, it's actually over 60% that they're covering, putting for the district. So that's correct though? Like, cause, So okay. it, I mean, it's taking the local revenue amount plus the fund balance. Okay. Because the fund balance is at our local level. So and that's how adding we... those two percentages together. Okay. Yep. So... Um, okay, I just want to make sure I was tracking everything that that is what I'm hearing. Um, and you know, helps me make a better decision, informed decision, everything I'm doing. Um, because I, I heard there's a lot of different 
uh, rumors out there or what people think. And I know everyone thinks, you know, either side or whatever, but some of the things is talking about what's attractive to the area, you know, with a good school and everything like that, or whether taxes are high. Um, there's a huge considerations in these decisions, you know, because it, it seems like the local taxpayers definitely paying most of the burden as of now, you know, so um, I, I don't know how that plays out. You know, I, I, I don't know. We don't have a crystal ball and that sort of thing. So it's just it it's eye opening to hear how much is actually put on the tax and how much we've increased taxes since 2014. Um, and we still have a deficit. Um, oh, it's just concerning. That's just something I wanted to bring up. And I got to look through the size again, because there's a couple of things you said, but I just got to get my thoughts together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you make a good point, Dan, about the, you know, increasing in taxes, right, over, you know, with the exception of like one and, you know, a partial one a previous year. But, you know, there's also kind of, uh, when you compare that to the inflationary costs with like special education and with cyber charter schools, you know, those increases in those mandated thing programs that we have to fund has far exceeded a percentage wise of what we're able to even increase at the local level. So it's, you know, even that lever that we have, you know, we are never able to pull it far enough to be able to make up for the shortfalls from the mandated spending from the state level. So it's, it's a challenge. Yep, I understand that. And also my back of the napkin math shows us probably over the last 10 years, averaging about three and a half percent increase all in, right? So keeping in mind that, you know, uh, you know our, our staff that get, you know, that get raises each year, three and a half percent on top of all these other, other items, you know, it, it is what it is. And, and the, the other, I don't find find very find very problematic about Act One, is it really doesn't allow. It makes it difficult. I shouldn't say it doesn't allow a strong word. It makes it difficult for a board to say, you know, I, I think we could probably get away with not going to the index, but then if something does in fact occur, and you need to go above the index, you can't easily. You could go to public referendum uh, and get approval from from the voters to go above the Act One index, and as we've talked about, one district has successfully done that, and it was State College, which they spent a lot of money, which you know I guess they had to to get that pushed through. So you know that's that's one that's one of the challenges because even as you called out, we did take out of the fund balance every other year. Well, that's because we couldn't. You know, we couldn't raise taxes not to take out of the fund balance, right? And the other thing is, you've seen, uh, you know, through the through the detail is, we've taxes aren't is only one lever. The other lever has been cutting costs. We have been cutting costs year over year, and we continue to look for every opportunity to do that. And that's the only way we've been able to not be in that negative situation before now. If you go back to a presentation Justin did five years ago, he probably had us already de dead and buried by certainly by now. But that's, you know, that that's because we've been able to mitigate it through, through the, you know, unfortunately, tax increases, which nobody wants to pay more taxes, but also cutting costs where we can, without having drastic impact to the, pr the programs that are delivered to our students. And that those, th those are just, the, you know, the two biggest levers we have. One of the things that I would um, like to add in um, is that Bermudian, we have a $32 million, $32 million in revenue. So we build our budget on that amount the same way as everyone else does with their checkbooks at home, same way everyone else has to do their budgets, to not cut spending somewhere along the line year after year, taking from the fund balance is not sustainable. The same way someone living outside of their means consistently dipping into their savings account without any changes in spending habits. The PSBA training had a section about budgets, which mentions how pulling from the fund balance year after year to balance the budget is not sustainable and to start looking for places in the budget to limit spending. 
So if this budget does not pass tomorrow night, we still have time until June 30th to get a budget together. We have the option of special meetings and our buildings and grounds meeting to work on the budget. What does everyone else think if the budget doesn't pass for tomorrow? You mean like come to a consensus that we're talking about? Uh, I, I think that I would, if, if what, you know, what's going to change between now and then, right? That's why we're here tonight. So the first thing I, I, I do want to speak to is um, one of the things that we don't clearly see in the history that Justin has shown is that he doesn't spend the budgeted amount every year. Your reflection of that is typically when you see an increase in the fund balance. So some of those years where we had that increase, it was because he didn't spend everything that the, pre the previous year's budget said he would. So there, there was that additional, that's why there was a, a, a surplus on the fund balance. So I wanna be clear, people are minding their spending. This, the, the one thing I've always appreciated about Bermuda is it's not a typical um, budget process where like people think that, and we've all worked places that have done this, you, know, you gotta spend it or, or you'll lose it. That, that's not typically how, how we rolled. Now, as far as this budget not passing tomorrow, I, I would like to see if we could get a budget passed tomorrow. Now, one of the things that um, I would entertain is that if the state were to come back with a drastically different funding for us for next year, and it happens before June 30th, I would happily reopen the budget to accommodate those discussions. Uh, the assumptions that Justin's making on, on how much he thinks he's got, the governor's actually going to get is based on the last how many years has he been in office? It was seven. Seven. So seven. Seven budgets he's put through, and he's 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 batting about what twenty five percent of what he wants. Right. Yeah. And uh, everything we're hearing is we're going to get what we've had in the past. We're not getting what he's proposed because he proposed the highest amount in the history of Pennsylvania. I mean, that was straight out of the appropriations chair mouth um he said you are not getting what the governor proposed period now what will happen in the end i don't know but that's a pretty pretty good pulse he has the pulse of what the house is thinking we're not getting what he proposed Justin, how recent did you have that conversation uh beginning of may I was, I think I got the same numbers too, because we were about combined, we were supposed to get about a million dollars from, from the- With the governor's proposed budget? From what I heard, yeah, it was $862,993 for basic ed, and then 159636 for special ed funding for a total of $1 million. $22,629 in state funding based on the proposed 22-23 funding formulas. Right, that's, that's what Governor uh, Wolf is proposing and that's what we're being told will not come close to happening. I mean, again, that's not the final, but that's, I mean, the people that are telling us that are the people that ultimately make the decisions. Um, and he's only one person, but he's, He's the appropriations chair. So he's the head of the committee that moves the budget process forward. So there was a lawsuit that was going on about the fair funding. Is the PA Supreme Court supposed to rule on that in June? That's a great question. I have not heard an update uh, on that. I don't know where that, where that stands. Um, I, I mean, I would think that if it, if it had any effect on the state budget for this year it would be loud and you would hear a lot about it right now because and the other thing that's very frustrating uh, from from your perspective and i'll speak for you a little bit in the fact that they the governor proposes a budget in february they don't have absolute conversations of negotiations until this week it's ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous, but it's something that we've 
as public school districts have complained about for years and it's not going to change. Um, but you know, they, and, and I get it, it's a negotiation process. So, I mean, he, he might, he's going to have to give on some things to get other things that he wants, but it is frustrating because I don't feel confident that we're going to have a budget, uh, from the state until 1159 on June 30th. And if that happens, it might be June 1st or June 2nd or July 1st or July 2nd, because they can, they have the ability to do that. So. For whatever it's worth, I got an email from the Pennsylvania Secretary of Education on June 7th with updated numbers um, that would be allocated based on the governor's proposed budget. For special education, it's 159,891. Basic ed increase is $1,101,639 for a total of $1,261,530. That was as of June 7th. But again, that's the pie in the sky, but those are the latest numbers passed along from the Secretary of Education. I had a lot of the same questions that Dan had already asked. Um, I guess my my thing view on it is the most frustrating part about it is um, what is driving the cost of our expenditures is by the state's doings, it's out of our control, but yet they don't wanna step up and supply more funding to, to balance it out so that we don't have to rely on the so much on the local population but it's it's, it's a no-win situation almost even then you don't know, raise in the taxes even through the act one index it doesn't put a dent in our deficit and we're putting all this extra burden we could find out anytime what the state's going to do but they can hold out till july 1st is that what you're saying actually they can go after july 1st we've had budgets not approved until september yeah by, by law we have to have ours approved we have to have ours approved by June 30th. So to get back to the to the point about um, if something if something miraculous were to happen where they would get something done early, you have the right to call a special meeting and you could reopen the budget until June 30th. June 30th at, at midnight is the final deadline for any district to have a budget approved. Now, with that. The implication of that, though, would be, let's just say we caught a huge break and, you know, we found, but we found out July 4th. The implication would be that that would have a, that would have a positive impact on the next year's budget. That's, I mean, that's the, the harsh reality. Well, it is, but I, but I can tell you that as we've pulled those, both of those levers, keep in mind, we're even able to have this discussion today versus being dead and buried. Had we, you know, because if we kind of took the attitude that, you know, past boards took the attitude that, well, that number's too big. It may, it may not be two years out, but it was certainly three years out. And we said, well, we're just not going to bother. Then we would already be in the negative. So it's you know I you know, hate to say it but it's you're, you're we're we're trying to to manage this and by buying if you will buying time you know we're we're finally starting to see traction on on uh, cyber school funding reform it, you know unfortunately that they, they're not moving at the pace that we need them to but if that if that funding reform that that was proposed to put a cap on how much they can collect per student that alone would 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 come be a huge win. For us, meaning that we would, this would be a much easier conversation. Mike talking about the, um, how a couple of years ago, we would have been like 9 million in the hole and dead in the water. Uh, last year, the three-year projection went out to school year uh, 2024, 20, 2025. At the beginning of that school year, the budget was projected to be short, 3.6 million with an end of year project projected shortage of 7.8 million. This year, the budget projection for that same school year has a beginning balance of 574,255 to the good with an end of year shortfall of $2.7 million. So that speaks to the significant swings that you can look like you're dead in the water and then things shift and it comes back. So, I mean, this is just, from last year to this year. And there's that significant of a shift. 
that's money that the taxpayers can't get back once they're taxed. Doesn't affect any of the programs. It doesn't affect any of the student education. I just don't know how much more burden you can put on the taxpayers. If you, last year, the big discussion was the inflation rate. The inflation rates doubled from last year. You know, everything's gone up in price and you're expecting people to pay more when they're already paying more for everything. You know, so how much more do we put onto the taxpayers? We have to look at what we can cost, cut in expenditures, which I know we're trying to do. But at the same time, we have to keep digging at that and not just keep spending more and expect the taxpayers to make up for that. With fixed incomes, you can't negotiate around their expenditure. I agree, Mary, even there's families, even in our district here with students that at this point, just in the past few weeks, they can't put food on their table because they are pushed to that extreme that those are the people I'm thinking of. Um, also, as far as the budget goes, did you, Justin, did you say that PCERS, the retirement was already earmarked in? Do you have something set aside or is it just kind of lumped in the fund balance? No, it's part of the, um, it's in the number, the fund balance number, it's not set aside. So the numbers that you're seeing include healthcare increases, PCERS increases, um, technology, um, everything you looked at in the audit is all included in that number. So it's not an additional number. So that number you're seeing includes those figures. Is there a way that we could set aside like just a little bit extra to help mitigate some of those high costs? Because what I'm thinking of, it's like if you have a six month premium for an insurance policy, you have to pay and it's due every six months, you kind of budget out every couple months, X number of dollars. So when you get to that six month mark and you have to pay that premium, you already have the money right there. So my understanding of the way that, that you do that is if, if you're going to increase taxes, you set 0.5 of a mil to piecers and then that piece will go across. Here, we're, we're already in a deficit. There's no, there's no way to set something else aside when you got to cover your deficit just to get a, a balanced budget. And the reality is, Boards in the past have made the decision to set money aside to increase that fund balance for this particular issue that we're facing. In the past, we've set money aside for P service. You know, it's undesignated, designated fund balance. That's that's what you were asking okay. earlier. Okay. Those were decisions made in the past because down the road, the boards and and Mike and those have been on before for some time can speak to that. But that's why the board made the decision to set money aside for future P service increases, future healthcare increases. Um, one of the other things I noticed looking at the audits um, was during the 2019-2020 school year, Bermudian paid $1.6 million in principal payments and $754,000 plus in interest payments for a total of $2.3 million in debt payments. The district borrowed an additional $34.9 million to construct a new middle school at the end of April 2020. I agree with the decision to build a new middle school. However, I think we could have taken out less debt and maybe paid our teachers and support staff a little more. Well, keep in mind that um, we, we could have, but we, st we still aren't done and we don't even have the money to finish the, you know, the, the, as far as the work on the old middle school. So that is, you know, that, that's kind of the this, this situation, right? So, um, what I'll add to is that the decision was made um, from the board's level to keep our debt service payments structured in a way that they do not increase the entire way through. So the three, the 2.6, which is only one component of it, actually it's around 3.5 total bond payment every year. That has been the same for ever since I've been here. So that's nine years. And that's what the debt schedule is set so that it, there is no increase or impact on taxpayers. So that that $3.5 million bond payment is the same from nine years ago out to two, 2040 
when the middle school will be paid off. Okay. One of the things I want to point out was that Bermudian has an extensive administration for a three building school district, many of whom earn a six figure salary, placing them in the top one third of the salary among their colleagues in the county, while our teachers are in the bottom third among their colleagues. When the new school board members were sworn in, most of the collective bargaining agreement was completed. As a new school board member, I would have appreciated the ability to advocate for our teachers by increasing their salaries, moving them to the next level up among their colleagues for pay. Okay, I'm not sure how that helps us with this conversation. Because if we had taken less of a bond for the school, that would have been a place to Okay, that happened when well, the middle school was already three there. years ago. So that is water over the dam. I mean, it comes back down to how does that help us? So basically, what I'm hearing is if, if we want to go forward with a 0% tax increase, then we also need to then talk about what are we going to cut? Was anything cut? What was cut last year from the 0%? Nothing was cut. Nothing was cut last. Well, I think we had, well, there, there were some savings that were from the year before and last year. One of the things that I mentioned last month was taking 10% from the Office of the Principals, Office of the Superintendent, the Board Services, um, cutting some of that budget. And I had mentioned some of this stuff last month, and I have the paper. So for the 2021, I had, you know, suggested a cut of 10%, which would have saved us $8,000 off to the superintendent, 10% cut, which would have saved us $155,000 in the office of the superintendent, a 10% cut would save us $96,000 for a total of $260,000. I did mention travel and I don't think with gas prices going up, that would be a good idea at this point because it would be easy to go over budget on that one. And then the general supplies budgeted, there was a 5% increase uh, for this budget. So I wanted to cut that by, for a savings of $22,000. What was budgeted was 522,000. And I wasn't sure if this would be reasonable down to 500,000. And then the total budget savings would be a total $282,420. So then my question then was- Can, can I give you an example? Yeah, what was so, the impact of what would-, of no, what would be So you, you were talking about the, and I'll just speak to the office of the superintendent, which covers a lot of things. It's not just me, it's a lot of things. We actually made a proposal in April that saved $173,000 by shifting personnel that would come out of the office of the superintendent, which is more than your 10%. That decision has already been made and we've already realized that savings. Fantastic. Your 10% was 90, we're at 173,000. Also keep in mind, I think Mr. Peer, the personnel changes that we made that would come out of the office of the superintendent by shifting, saved $173,000. Um, the other thing I wanna point out, Mr. Peer shared with everybody, all three buildings with their building level budgets is what 450,000 something, all three buildings, $450,000 total for three buildings. Just wanted to put that back out there. So we've already exceeded your expectations. Did you? 100%, yeah. Because I was just looking at the uh, actual budget for 2020, 2021. It was like a million dollars um, for those offices. And again, I, I, don't, I don't know. Mr. Peer can speak to all the details. It's, it's well beyond his people and support services. But I can tell you specifically out of that office, we just made changes to save $173,000 two months ago. That will not be $173,000 this year. It will compound each and every year based on the changes that we've made. One of the, one of the concerns I always have with a, if we were to come down and say, look, we're just going to do a blanket 10% cut, is we take the, we will disincent the administrators to cut on their own because they're like, 
if I cut and then they're going to come back and take another 10 percent, it's human nature. I mean, anybody that's managed budgets in a business, that's how it's worked. Right. If you know, when, when people come down with those, those, those broad edicts. So I'm not saying we don't look at cuts, but I want to specifically look at what we're cutting and not in an abstract fashion, because I, I think that's when, when, and again, this is even happens in businesses. When people do those flat 10% cut across the board, they never really know what they're impacting until they've impacted and then it's too late. That's kind of why I was just throwing it out as I, and I, as an idea. I, 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 I appreciate the spitballing, but that's but I just want to say that that that's my that is my one concern. So just to give you an example, uh, from the budget overview from just the month of May that we realized in the uh, uh, can you go to sorry can you go just into the slide for this year? Do a number. That's why I have page numbers. I don't have the page number on. <laughs> so it's after twenty twenty one. So it'll be 22, 23 slide here. This one, budget overview. Yep. So if you take a look in May, there's the 173,583. Take a look at savings from schedule A. That's special education. Those two items combined is almost $350,000 savings. However, when you look at special ed, we, we could be a, a student or two away from having to pay for something else. It really is, it's depend upon the needs of the students. And so anytime we see savings like that with special education, I always get nervous because somebody moves in and they have special needs, they have special programs. We are, that's a mandated cost that we have to, but right now we're super excited to be able to show you those two items. So again, getting back to just decisions that have been made and budget cuts, those two items alone are $350,000 in one month as a reduction. Thank you, Justin. I, I have another, I guess, general question. Um, the, the, again, the expenditures have been more than revenue, right? For mm -hmm. years. What are we, we're doing cuts and everything like that, but we haven't- Actually, no, they couldn't be because if the fund balance went up, yes. that means they weren't. That's okay. That's what now I remember what my question is. So we're presenting with the chart with the projection <clears throat> for two, three years out and so on. It's been going on for a while. You say it looked like we should have been shut down five years ago or something right. like that. And then when you brought up the um, fund balance history, it looks actually healthy, like mm -hmm. from year to year. What is the main call? It's not because of the tax increase, right? It's both. It's because of an influx of money coming, right? Well, no. It's no, it's, it's, it, so it's the tax increase, mm -hmm. but it's also savings that we've been able to garner. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Good. not filling positions. I mean, I, that chart was in here, right? Maybe it wasn't. The number of positions we've eliminated over this period was. Yeah, it has a, a one, right. one minus. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, I mean, it was like, I think 15, <laughs> so, somewhere in there. So again, the, the, the administration has been very diligent about grabbing those savings when they can without impacting the students. And so for instance, I shared with you tonight, we have a resignation. We're not posting that position. I'm gonna go look at class size elementary, which I think are really good. But I'll be honest with you, I also have to take a look at our special education needs. So if we can, if we can still have great class sizes and meet the needs of our special education students, that position would be one that we wouldn't fill right now. I just don't know that. That's going to be dictated by enrollment. And it's going to be dictated by student need. But as of right now, that position is not posted. So what's the impact of that? Salary, benefit. I don't know if that, the total financial impact of that, but that's a decision that we haven't, haven't made. The other thing you have to keep in mind, like this year that's been so frustrating, when you pass a budget, that basically you're passing a budget with the revenue that the state has allocated from the previous year. Okay. Once your budget's passed, then we get the real numbers. And historically that's been a little bit of an increase, but we don't know that until after you pass the budget. Thank you for that. So, so to add to that, Dan, um, so another part that I believe is my responsibility is yes, you as a board approve the final budget. My job is to spend money the way fiscally responsible, okay? 
So back to what Mike had said earlier, I do everything in my power to make sure that that deficit, like if it's 1.763625, that's the Equine Index. My goal is to come in under a hundred, I mean, under a million dollars on that. And I think every board member sitting up here wants me to do that, okay? That gets to what Mike was saying earlier, okay? Um, I said from way back in January and for the board members that have been on the board, they know how I operate. I'm very conservative when I budget. I'm not gonna take a risk. I'm not gonna put us in a position where I'm gonna put a number in that is extremely risky and it's gonna backfire. I'd rather have the other side that we have the savings at the end and we're building that fund balance and not taking from it. Okay. So, and another key piece that is so unpredictable and it's one matrix that we have as a school district and it's has a pulse on the local economy and that's the earned income tax. Okay. What we've been hearing and from pre-COVID and then once COVID hit, is we were gonna see a 30% reduction in our earned income. That has never happened. That has never happened. Now I'm saying that's one matrix that we have. And I'm, I'm sure there's many families out there that are struggling, but the matrix that we have to, to look at, our earned income has continued to steadily increase at the rates that it has been. So I don't know what that's attributed to, because I was expecting a 20 to 30% decrease because of COVID and with everyone losing their jobs. But earned income is exactly that, that you get taxed on your earned income. So that's people working. And it has not affected Bermudian Springs community, that one matrix. That's another reason why the revenue sometimes comes in higher because again, that's a very risky thing because it, a, a pandemic should have reduced our earned income tax. It did not. It did not. No, that's not Title One. That's 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 local. That's local revenue. Yep. And just for the record, we are not allowed to touch the earned income tax rate. <laughs> In case anybody was wondering. <laughs> Set by the county. Or who said so, that? No, no, what happened was for those, all right, little history lesson. So there used to be this thing called the occupational tax based on your job title, which I thought was brilliant when I moved to Pennsylvania. Um, there was an opportunity back in the mid 2000s for districts to dump the occupation tax that was based on job title and move to an earned income tax. The key caveat was it had to be budget neutral, which means that you couldn't say, oh, all right, you know, we were bringing in $500,000 in occupational privilege tax. We're gonna set our EIT rate so we bring in a million. It had to be one for one. The, the difference is, is that obviously as, yeah, and one of the reasons why we're seeing it going up now is we know that there's wage inflation, right? I mean, just look at minimum, you know, minimum wage. We're seeing it you know, with our own employees to retain people to, to work on our support staff. We've had to, we've had to adjust salaries. Well, that's gonna cause the earned income revenue, in, income tax revenue to go up, which is unlike real estate, right? Because real estate is based on an assessment that was done in 2010. So, you know, my house, whatever was valued then, I'm paying on that same assessed value as that was, you know, 13 years ago, 12 years ago. And, it's you know yeah, the only thing that's going up obviously is is the millage, you know it, 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 you know so you, one would, could argue that if they did an assessment every year, which you, nobody wants, right? It, we probably would have kept pace, but that's a piece that that does not. So, but anyway, so that that's how we got to the the earned income tax rate that we that we have. I have another question about the. Um the budget that's up for review. Um, you talked about fuel earlier. It, was that calculated into the budget, the rising cost of fuel? Like when you first put the numbers in, was that at a certain dollar amount? And if we approve that, we'll just use a round number $3. And we know that it's $5 now. <laughs> it, does that mean that the money is exhausted already if we prove it at this budget rate? Or what does that mean? 
I can tell you that the budget, if, if the fuel cost stays the way they are currently for the whole year, our fuel budget will be shot plus a lot more. Yes. So we will be over budget in our fuel. So where is 100%. that funding come from? That's, uh, that's going to be looking at other areas that I can take money from and not spend that we were originally planning on. That's what my role is to find the place to take that from. I mean, we're looking at an, you know, you just say it's 8% inflation. That's going to impact us. So even. So we're already 8% in the hole. I, I feel like we're just, I think someone said this earlier, we're just kicking this further and further down the road. Well, well and we, we are. And I feel like we need to, and I know it's a huge problem, address the problem and try to figure that out and solve it. And I know it, we already said off limits is having the state pay us, right? Retirement and charter school reform could happen five years from now, not anytime soon. So um, I, I don't know how, but I think that's why we were all put on this board, I think, appointed, elected, however we got here, is not only make tough decisions, but also to address the real problems and try to figure out how we're going to fix this. I know some of it's out of our control, and it's going to take all of us, not just one of us, to try to figure this out. But I, I don't know. The hard part is doing no tax increase or doing the max. And I've seen what the max, it just delays it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen sooner or later. I guess like, that's another question. What, what does that mean? What's going to happen? Because people are scared about programs and teachers being fired, all this stuff. Like, it would be well beyond that, right? Like well, if it, I think it would depend. If we came in with a balanced budget, you would start cutting anything that wasn't mandated. Gotcha. I mean, that's the, am I correct? And then what is the impact if the school goes into receivership? Yeah. Then, I mean, then local control is gone. Um, Are they tied to an act one index when they're in receivership? I'm sorry? Are they tied to an act one index when they're no, in receivership? The, the, the state takes total control and they, they make it work. I feel like that's like almost the real conversation that has to have be had. And maybe it's been had before in the past with the board. Um, and what, what are we doing about that? What we, 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 we have, and I'm going to go back to... Uh, if you go back to the few, we've done a tremendous amount over the last nine years. We've eliminated 13 professional staff positions. We've made significant healthcare. So we have worked really, really hard to keep kicking the can down the road. Like every school district, that's it. there's two districts right now in receivership that receive a significant state subsidy. And we're not in the worst shape when you see these numbers. We're not in the worst shape by any means of school districts, and there's some that are in they're in a better shape than us. But eventually, with those pieces, numbers, every school district will hit it. But every school district is trying to push that off as long as possible. So I do struggle with the idea that we haven't done anything. That's why I gave you the historical data. We've done a tremendous amount while still providing a top quality program for kids, providing opportunities for kids and resources for kids. I'm really, really proud of that. We've tried to hold off on on all of those things. To Mike's point, we will continue to do that. We will reevaluate every every time. I can't tell you, like, here's here's the stress that I have. When I thought that we were going to have this position, okay, um, I know our learning support case class case numbers are pretty low. So to even consider and entertain reallocating a position for learning support like doesn't make sense budget wise. But then you have to. And you have the human aspect of the needs of kids. Like I feel, I, I, I have this two sides, like, okay, do we want to entertain the human aspect and really provide some support across multiple grade levels? I can't do that because of the budget. Like that's a very real thing right now that, that we're talking with it. I'm sharing with you because we're having the position up. We've been doing that for 10 years. This is not new. We've made decisions not to, and you could go back and look at some of the personnel. One particular year, we, we cut back on reading support at the middle school. So one could argue when students are, are struggling, students are struggling with, you know, English language arts, we, we cut back on our support for reading at the middle school. That was a decision the board made. We didn't fill the position. Um, driver's ed at one point. I know I've heard people talk about the late bus and the decision was made that was $50,000. 
quantify that fifty thousand dollars every year since it's been made. Now it's a quarter of a million dollars. You know, so we our our goal, you are at our goal is to kick that can down the road as far as we can and as often as we can, like every other school district. And so we've often said the decision you make today, it's compounding effect on on the future. And so those personnel decisions that we've made is very, very significant. The insurance is extremely significant. Um, we've actually, the other thing we've done too in the midst of this, and it's really tough to tell the story, is we have a special ed consortium to reduce special ed costs with two other school districts in the county. We did that to save money, but yet provide a high quality program. So every year we ask the same question, can we bring any classes back? Can we add a new program? Can we add a staff member? And those things are happening. All of that was done because of because of budgets. And so I, I just implore you to go back and, and, and yes, I, I, I'm going to defend, we worked really, really, really hard for 10 years. And so if somebody was, it's just simply not accurate. Like we've done a lot. And that first couple of slides was trying to depict that. And actually, and you can see if you look at the detail, like this month, like this projecting here, each month, there are, there are certain things that have been done each and every month that we know have a compounding effect. And so at some point, you know, we will have to look at, you know, other programs that aren't mandatory. If we get that, our goal is to not get to that and, and to continue to push that. So Jen, like it's music players, when you, when you saw the fun balance and how we've been, like that's exactly what we've been trying to do for a number of years. And it isn't any one thing, it's a combination of a bunch of little things. And those things add up. And when you add up a bunch of little things moving in the same direction, you get tremendous support. And that's that's really what's got us to this point. Well, I hope you don't think I was like personally attacking you saying not, you weren't doing anything. No, listen, but, this is this is I work for me and sleep, we're for me and friends right here. I've been here for 14 years. And I take great pride in the quality of education that we provide, the people that we have, and the experience our kids have. And so yeah, we've worked really hard to maintain that and actually not just maintain it, but get better and create opportunities. So I didn't take it personally, but as the district in our role, I, I am super proud of the work of folks here, people at the building level, our teaching staff to continue to work and to grind and create great opportunities for kids. And that's the goal. And that's still that's our goal. goal. Every, everybody here, your kids here, everybody, that's our goal and try to minimize the impact on that. I, I think we've done a pretty good job up to this point. And so our goal is to like, let's keep kicking that can down the road. I just wanted to say that as a new school board member, we don't know the back history of the past 10, 14 months. Mm -hmm. So you try to brainstorm to come up with these ideas, ideas. So, you know, agreeing with what Dan said, it's not personal and it's not that we don't appreciate what you've done, but I'm just trying to throw some ideas out there. And I think a lot of times we see some of what you're talking about behind the scenes where you save money and stuff like that. And, but I think out in the public appearance of things where they don't all see all that, all they see is like, okay, we live in a rural area, a lot of people with fixed incomes. And, they, and I get questions like, why the middle school have to be so fancy? Or why do we have all this turf fields? Or, or why do we, why are we trying to be like, you know, a Cumberland Valley or a Gettysburg? So those are the questions that I get right out in the public when we talk about budgets and boards. So, but we see more of what you're talking about when you're saving money with personnel and things that they don't always, they don't see the whole picture sometimes. Like, I think I have a, I have a perspective I can share. I think I'm the only medium school board level person here. I've only been here for a few years. So I'm not the new or the veteran people. So I think I've more recently gone through a lot of experience, like a lot of the new members then too. The first time I sat through one of Justin's presentations, I think I had a similar reaction to a lot of the newest board members too, that why have we done this? Why is this continued to happen? Why is our expenditure so high? What did the rest of the board do this whole time? Um, Cause that's the, the number one or the most common reaction. It's the reaction that Travis was getting to too, that a lot of our people in the, in our community have that same reaction. Then I start talking to Justin, listening to Justin's presentations and, and interacting and seeing what our school board does. You know, 90% of our expenditures are mandated. That's what we've talked about numerous times then too. Between salaries, benefits, PEASERs, special education, cyber schools, that's 90% that we don't have control over. A lot of the debate we've had tonight is really over that last 10%. So that even if that last 10% is the only thing that we have control over, that 10% is around 3 million or whatever then too. And once we start reaching into that, once we start cutting that, 
that's what the that's not an abstract thing then too. So that's what's starting to become more real too. Because of the balances that we've had over the years, because of the savings, like like Dr. Hotchkiss and Justin shared tonight, you know, because of their planning and savings, we saved over six million dollars over the last couple of years. You know, that that's real savings. That's one of the reasons why we kick the can down the road isn't the isn't the best thing too. What we've done is continue to provide great outcomes at Bermudian for reasonable rates. So when we have to have a tax increase, even though Act One index happens to be nine dollars a month, you know. So again, people are on the fixed incomes. It's not a trivial amount, but at the same time, too, if we can continue to do all the things that we do at Bermudian for another six years, for another five years, ultimately that increase, that that hole that we see in some of Justin's presentations, it might still come. But when or if that hole does come, we can control the size of that deficit. You know, that's why we might need an increase this year to control that size. Because it's easy to say when I talk to people, I've talked to plenty of people like all of us have. We talked to people in the supermarkets. We get we've gotten plenty of emails this past month. Um, I've talked to business owners then, too, because clearly it impacts the businesses in our school district. So there's a real impact then, too. But what will happen when those expenditures come? It's easy. That's the first thing everyone, no matter what their political backgrounds are, whatever their leanings are, one of the first things they ever tell me is, why is our cost so high? Why do we keep spending? I explain the 90% to them, but then they're like, well, what can we cut? What can we do? Let's cut expenditures. And we've talked a little bit about that, but we've only talked about it in an abstract. That 10% of stuff that we can cut is the non-mandated programs. Those non-mandated programs are our extracurriculars, our sports that so many of our kids excel at. Those non-mandated forms is our agricultural department. So we're a farming community. We have a great ag department. That's not mandated by the state. You know, we have... ACTI that Mr. Chubb goes and attends all the time to agrees great vocational applications to our student. That's not mandated by the state. These are real programs then too. When we just say we're going to cut expenditures, that can't just happen in a vacuum. We can't just dictate cuts. That last 10% when it starts to become real is going to have other implications then too. So I think some of the problems we have then too is we're put in a lousy situation as school board directors. We have to sit up here then too, and they're forcing us to choose they being Harrisburg, you know, the state of Pennsylvania, they're forcing us to choose between the financial security of our school district and raising taxes. And neither of those choices is going to make, there's going to make somebody that's going to be unhappy with those two choices, but those, that's what's put in front of us then too. Those are the two choices that we have to make. So I ultimately still propose that we still have to have some level of increase because we need to make sure we have that budget then too, that'll continue to have that last 10% is all of the programs that our students need. The most of our students need those programs. We have 90% participation in extracurricular. So one of the great reasons so many people enjoy coming to Bermuda that outcome we have with our students is because of those extracurriculars. You know, the parents, most of the parents want those programs for our students. We have to have that budget then too, to make sure we can continue to recruit, support, and and retain our professional staff. You know, they see that then too. They know what kind of reputation Bermudian has then too. So we need that. And then the last part then too is when Bermudian is successful, we'll all be successful. Like with our taxpayers themselves then too. The taxpayers will start to see a return on in investment then too. Because when Bermudian has that good reputation, people want to move in here. So eventually that'll keep your property values high then too. We haven't talked a lot of bit about that then too. Sometimes it's a little abstract. I get it. But the point is though too, is if someone wants to come here, you have to spend $9 more a month, but ultimately 10 years from now, you'll save tens of thousands of dollars in property value. That's a good investment for every stakeholder in our school district. So again, that was kind of my point of view then too when I first started on the board and why I still support some level of increase. Just want to clarify, um, offering students vocational programs is required. And so the reality, the reason that we joined, it used to be Gettysburg Tech Prep and ACTIs. We didn't have an agreement with any vocational school. And if a school district doesn't have an agreement, that means any one of your students can attend any vocational program. So we had students going to York County. We had some going to Cumberland Perry. We had some going to Tech Prep. And I'll be honest with you, tuition costs when you're not a member of consortium was skyrocketing. It's actually higher than what we pay for ACTI now. It was one of the savings. So honestly... The reason that we joined was because we needed to provide that opportunity for kids. And it made sense for us to join the consortium. We had a lot of conversation about just the need from students. And, um, and now, you know, we've gone from, and I see Dr. Redding in the audience from back in the day, we had like 10 kids. Now we've got like 48 that go to the tech prep program. And so that is a requirement. I just wanted to Right, but still then the opportunity then too, we provided a better opportunity for our students. ACTI provides that opportunity. It's one location, you know, it'll, you know, it's right. easier for the students to get there and back and forth. So that's just another thing that Bermudian has, like Mike said, it's another savings, another opportunity that we provide for our students here at Bermudian. 
that's a requirement that cannot be cut contrary to some parents belief. Exactly. And that is correct. The non mandated cuts extracurriculars don't get cut because it's essential to it's very important to the kids, to the community, building relationships. I have two kids in the district. Both of them are in athletics. Athletics to me is not, it may be non-mandated by the state, but it's mandated for, because it's the right thing to do. You can't cut those programs from the kids, athletic or non-athletic. So we look at the other things and we have those hard conversations on where to cut. And talking about retention, we need to keep our teachers pay out of the bottom third in the, in the county to help retain and help recruit teachers to come here to Berm. Because if the teacher's salary among their peers are in the bottom third, why would they wanna come here? So maybe we need to bump the teacher's pay a little bit that would help the retention, help draw staff, as well as, you know, like I said, extracurriculars are not mandated, but they should, they should not be mandated, but they absolutely cannot be cut under no uncertain terms whether it's band, whether it's art, whether it's anything, because each kid is going to find a different niche that they enjoy. Each kid is going to develop friendships that will last possibly a lifetime within those extracurriculars. So extracurriculars do not get touched. That's where we look at other things. It's too imperative, it's too imperative the to, the kids, oh, sorry, to the children's mental health and the parents' mental health, to be honest. Parents meet other parents and they build friendships because their kids are in you know, softball, baseball, track, football, those parents come together and build communities within our community here. The athletics and non-athletics cannot be touched. Keeps them out of river run. Motivation. Some of the shortage now also is we have 143 students out in cyber charter at $2.1 million. If a lot of those kids, and I know every single student is not gonna come back, but if the majority say like 120 of those students come back because they left over the masking issue, majority of them. If they left, if they came back right there is, let's say, I don't, about just under $2 million back. Right. And, to burn. But we, we can't. Oh, I get that. I well, get that. That, that would be a conversation then for next. So, and I don't think that number is quite accurate, right? Because if you look at where our numbers are now and compare them to pre COVID, it's, it, it's higher, right? But it's only about 50, not 120. So, well, no. And, that, and, and when you look at the cost increase, right? We have less students. We have less money. students and we're paying more money. So, even if we took it back to like that pre COVID number, it's still going to be higher than what we were for pre-COVID. Pre yeah. It's not going to be 2.1 million. Right. Right. No, so no, it won't be. It, it would be lower than that, but it's, it's not going to be, we're not going to make up that deficit with that. Historically, we were, we were running about 60 to 70 kids in a, in a given year average over time and out, outside cyber pre-COVID. Pre I, so I, I do have a question on the extracurricular while we're talking about it. Um, which, yeah, we don't want to cut those programs, but I do have a question on how do we come up with the extracurricular contract payout numbers? It's they seem part to be, of the collective bargaining agreement. It's right. negotiated in the collective okay. bargaining agreement. Because it just seemed like the, the numbers are all over the place on what they yeah. are. Yeah. They and are. I'm just kind of like, okay, yeah. how do we come up with Looks these? Looks like they were picked out of a hat. <laughs> right. And some of them, I'm like, I mean, I'm not trying to throw Derek under the bus, but I'm like, you know, auditorium manager, really? <laughs> I mean, with um, yeah, some of them, I'm like, you know, can we cut any of these? But I know we can't now, but because it's already in the collecting argument, but I would question some of those. And some we aren't filled. That's, that's the other piece. 
like I wanted to say that too, I think that was the point uh, the point I was trying to make is we can't just talk about cutting expenditures abstractly. That's all we've done so far tonight. I don't want to cut any programs. So extracurriculars is critical to what we're doing. All of our programs are critical to what we are success of our students. But to say that somehow we're not going to raise taxes and still maintain all of our programs is just incongruent. Those two things don't match. So the way we've been able to do it for so many years is because of a balance of all of the savings that Justin shared with us and some version of tax increase that we can't continue just to rely on savings to make up that gap. That if we're going to talk about no tax increase, but then still the importance of all those programs, which we all agree, those programs are critical to the success of our students and all of us want to maintain them. But to maintain them requires investment, requires continued investment from our community. So at some level, our community, you know, we Bermudians started before most of us were even born. So taxpayers have been investing in this resource for 40 some years, we'll say. Um, so that's resource into that our community is invested in. So we are responsible to continue to maintain and be responsible for that investment. So that requires continued investment, especially so we can continue to have all of the sports. We can continue to have our great musicals. So we continue to have our great music programs. We send students to national art programs, you know, like those are the outcomes we need to continue to have, but they don't have, they don't happen if we don't aren't responsible enough to continue to ask for investment. I don't remember anyone saying anything about cutting programs. There has to be something. If we want to reduce expenditures, eventually it has to get cut, caught up. I don't know what other unfunded parts of our budget there are. So maybe Mike has other ideas. There was no, That's where no, we, no, no programs were cut last year. No programs weren't. So the idea then too zero is inter zero tax. Eventually. Yeah, but we, but we made that up with fund balance, right? So it's, it's not like we magically, you know, lowered expenses either. Right. We, we just said we weren't raising raising revenue and we completely made up that balance with fund balance. And, and we can do that again this year. Right. But we can't do it again the year after that. So that yeah. that's basically, you know, where we are. Right. So keep in mind that if we would have raised taxes. So question, why, why did the board, I guess I would say give credit to the board for last year, that they didn't raise taxes, right? So why did they not raise taxes? I think part of the idea is once we talk about them too, is all of our stakeholders, some I've mentioned lots of times then too. I think I've talked to you about it then too. So the idea then too is last year was the year for our taxpayers. Our taxpayers are just as critical to the success of Bermudian as our parents, as our students, as our faculty, as our administration. All of those stakeholders are critical to our success. So to continue to ask our taxpayers to do the max every year isn't any more fair to them than cutting programs or potentially cutting programs for our students. We don't want any of those outcomes. So we have to try our best to balance it. So we continue to look for savings like Dr. Hotchkiss and Justin have done. And at the same time, we're going to need to continue to have that investment to make sure that we don't get into that negative hole. Hopefully then over the time then too, some of the things that we can do to change some of the things that have happened in the future is, is to advocate for some of those parts then too. So it's not just a, we're just not relying on our taxpayers to make it up then too. Like, I talked to Torn Ecker, I emailed Governor Wolf, you know, I advocate for ways then to get more funding into our school district, talk to local businesses to make to make donations, you know, that there's other things that we as school board members can do. But even then, that's still not enough things to get us back to a balanced budget. We need all of those stakeholder buy ins And part of that buy in is investment from our taxpayers. So. I would, I would agree with some of what you're saying. You know, we can't go you know, you can't go year after year and not raise taxes. You know, it has to be tax increases through certain years. Um, what I'm looking at is like we've raised taxes for 15 years and then we gave them one year off, right? Um, and last year, the previous board members, one of the main reasons why, you know, it was brought up not to raise taxes was because of the 4% inflation. And now we're double that inflation. Um, you know, my personal opinion is yes, we need to invest and in, in at some point in time, yes, uh, we're going to have to raise taxes. My personal opinion is we need to get through one more year without that burden on the taxpayer. And then uh, from there, then move forward and, and do what we have to do if, if we have to raise taxes. If anybody went back and listened to last year's board meeting, everything you guys argued to not increase taxes is doubled now. The cost to the consumers double. The inflation rates double. Everything, everything that people are paying, you know, grocery wise, gas prices, daycare, and not everybody's getting double extra income. That is false. I haven't gotten anything in a couple of years. So 
you know, not everybody's making extra, but still paying more. When the inflation's double, I don't know how you keep trying to, you know, beg the tax, not beg, but hit the taxpayers with more. Well, yes, you understand that at some point it's got to go up. But if every rationale you guys used last year, it's it's doubled now. So how do we ask for more? Oh, yeah, but that same apron, that same doubling is also now impacting us. And and again, we're looking at another. Uh, now we're a year closer to where we're not going to be able to get to a balanced budget without dr some draconian cuts. One of the other things I'd like to add in is that you know, again, with the 2024 20, 2025 school year, there was a swing of three million dollars to the positive in the beginning with a shift towards the end of the projected school year of $5 million. Those are significant shifts. So it may not be as bad as it was before. And not only that, but you know, yes, the gas price, gas is going through the roof. It's projected to go higher. Inflation is 8.6%. People may be getting raises, but it's definitely not enough to cover the cost of inflation. So, you know, last year, it was, this, it was the same thing, you know, talking about how, you know, we could be far, far in the red and then, you know, things work out because something always seems to work out somehow. I've often chastised Justin sometimes because he runs magic all the time that over, over the years with this board, Justin is excellent at his job. He's done great work. He's always given us numbers that are underwater. And then a year later, a few months later, they get better. And that's a testament then to all the hard work that our administration has done to save us money. It's also part of the fact then too that this school board has done as best it can responsible increases for our community that we balanced to zero. And I wish we had more time to do more zeros, maybe with some advocacy and some changes at the state level. That's why we need that increase to give it time to happen. Because we all know that our politicians move extremely slowly. And the idea that the budget subsidy from the Governor Wolf will most likely not happen, but the, the word that, that we have is that the people in Harrisburg, that there is movement for a cyber school change or a cyber school cap on funding. But that might not happen until next year. We might have to pass next year's budget before Harrisburg finally even starts capping those numbers. So we need to give that time to happen, that we don't wanna put Bermuda in a negative or a bad situation before that happens. We need to give it time. We need to allow them a chance to help us. And that might take another year or two, which requires us to make the tough decision to help keep Bermuda going in the meantime. Hey, Corey, I know you're on remote. Do you have anything you would like to share? Justin, what would the um, average increase on a household be at the uh, Act One index? So it ranges from seven dollars and fifty-six cents in York Springs to nine dollars and seventy-five cent. I'm sorry, nine dollars and eighty-six cents in Reading Township. That's per month. Okay, that, that's per month. Um, just, just thinking a little bit different outside the box here. Um, you know, a lot of households, and I imagine have cell phone bills. A lot of households probably have, you know, some type of TV service. Um, these are, you know, non-essential things, whereas our school district is essential. And we as a board need to make a right decision to keep kicking this can down the road and not have that can get run over and crushed. Because once it's crushed, you're not gonna get it back in the shape that it was before. So think about that as a board.
sorry, you couldn't have me quick now. I wanted to say it too. I don't like the uh, kicking a can down the road metaphor. I uh, I just want us, I want us to stop using that mostly then too, because I like the idea that we're doing response. We still are doing as responsible budgeting as we can. I know on the surface, the fact that expenditures are higher is is not is not cool, you know. But the fact that ninety, I just reiterate the point. The fact ninety percent of our costs are, are in that expenditures. That's what's causing that to happen. But our ability then to to moderate our expenses, what we spend the money on, how we increase taxes, and the savings we find doesn't allow us to kick the can down the road. It allows us to continue to have responsible budgets each year that allows us to continue to do all the great things that Bermudian does. It allows us to do the extracurriculars, allows us to do music, allows us to recruit and find good teachers, that those things happen because we continue to responsible budget. And if we take a step backwards, we jeopardize all of those things. So last year, several of the board members made comments you know, in favor of a 0% increase. One member talked about difficulties from the pandemic and how a 0% increase would be a nice reset while pointing out, you know, Justin, you've taken things that have looked really awful and you flipped them around. You're good at your job. There's no doubt. Um, another member went on to, on to say um, projections, uh, you know, speaking to Justin's ability to work with the budget, that things looked really, really grim, but then you flip them around. Someone else also pointed out how the income stays the same, but expenses like gas and groceries continue to rise. Another board member from last year member uh, pointed out how projections change in a short period of time, stating we have the fund balance to balance our budget and save the taxpayer as much money as possible. These are all comments from last year's board meeting where the board was in favor of a 0% tax increase. And based on what was said about the health of the fund balance this year, I don't see with, you know, inflation being twice the amount, gas prices going through the roof, and the cost of food and services going through the roof, that it would be fair or reasonable to put extra burden on our taxpayers. We're not talking about cutting anything. We're not talking about cutting programs because we all understand the importance, once again, of the, extra, of the extracurricular programs. So I think we can, again, this year, not raise taxes and not sacrifice anything. I'd say we're, we're, not, we're not making that decision this year, right? But a 0% with what we know today in the current climate almost guarantees that that will have to be a conversation for the next budget. Unless something changes though, right? Unless, like, like I said, with this, what we know right now, like right? charter school reform, with, with or what we know like, okay. right now, right? Because okay. we, we can't make decisions on information that we hope for, right? So we have to make information or decisions with information we have, facts we have right now in front of us. That's the hard part for me because the facts are with all the projections that Justin's provided is it doesn't get fixed, right? Like eventually there's going to be a stop. <laughs> there's going to be like an end. Yes. Yes. That's that's and that's across the state, right? That's yes, not, we're not, not just us, we're not everywhere. unique, right? Yeah. So there has something has to happen. I don't know what it is, but something has to happen. Something's got to give. That's what's hard. So can can I provide a, a just maybe a thought here, right? Because we we and Justin pointed this out in the beginning of his presentation, right? That we have the the increase in the homestead credit from the act one for this year, right? $40 and 57 cents, I think, or something like that, right? So if we didn't go to the index, right? We went like halfway. That almost becomes a wash on the average for the average increase of the taxpayer. Is that, is that fairly close, Justin? Yeah, the average, the annual for uh, half midpoint for York Springs, it's 45.33. Uh, the average for Reading Townships, 59.15. So we're down to dollars and maybe cents per month that's, of that's a total annual. increase. That's the annual. Yeah. So ju just to like, this could be from a taxpayer's perspective, close to neutral, even if we do an increase in this year because of that additional homestead exclusion from the Act 1 funds provided by the state. And that provides breathing room in future budget years, right? So 
I mean, it's still going to be a tough conversation in the next budget year. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like that, you know, two point whatever is going to, you know, make next year's problem go away. Right. But it's compounding. It makes that conversation a little bit closer. Right. Because to Matt's point, there's hard conversations to be had and in, in what we have, what levers we have to pull. And nobody's going to want to have those conversations. So I think whatever we can do to stave that off this year, I, I think we have to do that. You know, the other thing too is that, that I, I think is important to call out is the fact that we talked about it with the lunch budget and the lunch prices that if we were to do nothing this year, next year, we might have to go high. And I, I suspect next year's Act 1 index is going to be significantly higher than it was this year because we, we know the cost of living for, you know, that they're projecting for Social Security increases are you know, they're going to be almost 9% next year. So if they're doing a call for, for Social Security. I would say, I think that it's probably safe to say that we're going to see the Act 1 index be, be, be a lot higher, which then, you, you know, you run, into the, you run into the risk of you could be, you know, if for some reason those things that we're, we're, we're uh, hoping are going to occur don't, you could be looking at even, you know, a, even a, a you know, larger impact next year because again remember these this you know obviously this compounds right so like i said well, i just want to say too i want to reiterate the the comparison of those impacts then too the impact then of a nine dollar a month increase is again it's not trivial it's something that everyone might struggle with but i think we have to compare that then with the potential in the future then of losing more programs then too. The programs that we all agree are critical, but none of us want to lose, but then we have to weigh those two increases. Can, can our community for, take, that, take another investment of $9 a month to continue to have all of those programs? Because as we get to next year, if we don't have that, maybe instead of it being a more manageable system that we can balance, maybe it gets more out of control and we get too far underwater. So the way we set up the agenda on the, the advice of the solicitor, because we knew this was a tough conversation. And so um, under letter, Justin, can we, do you guys need this presentation anymore? If we can go to the, let me just go back and I'll start sharing so I can. Sorry. So this page here. So this, in theory, I mean, I think Mike talked about it earlier. You can kind of come to a consensus on what you wanted to see on the, the agenda first. That would be great. But if not, the idea behind this approach, and we'll, we could do anything. I just want to just kind of get back here to kind of give everybody a pause to, to think a little bit. So the way this is laid out now, option A is to the Act 1 index. So you conceivably, as a board, could make the motion, second, have a conversation, and then vote option A up or down. If it passes, option B and C are eliminated. If option A gets voted down, then you could go for a motion for option B, which is the midpoint of 2.35, make the motion, second, conversation, vote it up or down. If that doesn't pass, then you go to C. So, or you could flip-flop. You could put zero first, or you can have one. I'm sharing with you just to give you options to consider. So each of these, unless you have another number, that we, we pick those because that's what Justin has always shared the budget with, zero halfway act one you can flip them you can consider the zero first motion if the mo if you don't get enough motion and you don't have it up or down then you move on to the next item so you you have options to how you want to approach this <coughs> based on all of your conversations that's why i just wanted to revisit so again just to make sure we're on the same page because you noticed 
when you look at the mills, it doesn't have the percent. So that's why I'm telling you what it is. So option A is the Act 1 index of 4.7. Option B represents 2.35. Option C is zero. So you can keep it as is. You guys can say, no, we want to have one on here and vote it up or down. The vote, vote it down. <clears throat> you can have a separate motion where somebody could create something at the, on the spot or it's voted down. You could have a special meeting. We're not good at well, I, again, I'm just trying to share with you all of the options so that, again, so you can equip yourself with information to make a decision. All of those things are a possibility. If the board should choose to do so, we can reverse and do the zero first to consider versus the Act 1 index to consider. Or if there's some number in between those, Justin will have to plug into the formulas to determine what the uh, details are. So. I just wanted you to be aware. That's why these options are there. So again, you go to option A and it passes, then option B and C are, are just cut from the agenda. If it doesn't pass, then you need a motion and a second conversation to consider option B, same process, each one of those. So, Yeah, it, it, I mean, to be honest, if there's another option that you are considering, it would be very helpful to know that tonight because like I've said from about the food service, it's highly regulated. I have to put it into the PDE um, database and it spits out the millage rate, the percentage and the revenue. That's the number I have to use. So it's not like a two second, if you want a 1% increase, actually I have that here. <laughs> <laughs> if you want a 3%, I have that here, but I mean, if there is another option other than those three that are on the agenda, it would be helpful to know that so I can prepare the numbers so it's readily available. But it's not required. Options are always good. So. In, in the, the spirit of keeping the conversation well, going to get some guidance, do you want to keep it as is? Well, um, before, before we go there, okay. okay. I think we've heard from everybody but Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I like to hear from you. Ruth. I would move option C to option A. Okay. So to satisfy what um, Dr. Hotchkin is saying, these are the three options we're going to put on the agenda tomorrow. And like you said, vote up and down, whatever. And if we want to put other options on, we need to decide that now. Let Justin know so we can be prepared. That's what we're discussing right now. Okay. I'm good with it. I, I am as well, though I would like to keep the current order. I'm good with it too. I'd like all the options in the current order also is fine. I mean, if you flip it, doesn't matter, but all the options I think are reasonable. So just to confirm, you, you don't want Justin to calculate any other percent. Can you bring no, it up by <laughs> <laughs> Okay. He's got the top, the middle, and the bottom. I think that's- I think we're good. Okay. Corey, are you okay? Yeah, go ahead, Corey, with you, order. I, I just, I just, sorry, hang on one second. All right, go ahead now. Yes, I'm, I'm good with the order and the percentages that have been provided. Corey, can you repeat that? I hit the wrong button. I'm sorry. I said, yes, I'm, I'm good with the order and I am also good with the percentages that have been provided. Thanks. Okay. Item 14, ACTI. All right. Uh, there's not too much to provide for an update. The biggest thing that happened last month was um, we passed the budget. 
um, all the districts. And then of course the ACTI, the jock personnel went ahead and passed it also. So that's the biggest highlight from last month for uh, ACTI. So that's all I got. Thanks. Okay, at this time, we're gonna start with uh, public comment. Uh, let me get my timer set before somebody comes up. Keep your remarks to five minutes and also uh, state your name uh, and we'll open it up now. Good evening, Larry Redding, Abe McClellan Drive, East Um Before I address the topic that I came uh, to share, I would encourage each board member tomorrow morning to call your legislator and your senator and tell them what you spent the last basically four months debating on how you're going to balance a budget, uh, especially when they're sitting on uh, a $4.5 billion surplus and still trying to figure out how to spend the American rescue monies. And as was pointed out, you know, the mandated costs that they could direct, uh, the one that drives me absolutely crazy is the Peacers thing created by the legislature. And they're the only group that can change that. They could fund, you know, a portion of that to, uh, so you don't have this conversation going on for hours whenever it's something that they could they could have uh, addressed for you. Um, my main topic is to advocate for more than what the minimum requires as it relates to the publication of the minute or the, the agenda for the board meeting and the timeliness of that posting and the attachments that uh, so are associated with the agenda. Uh, it's very frustrating tonight to sit here and know that each one of you are looking at an agenda and attachments and referring back and forth, but really not having the information uh, in hand. And there's really no reason that I can understand uh, why that public information isn't shared. Uh, I don't know that there was anything confidential that couldn't have been shared to the general public as it was probably shared to each of the nine board members. You're getting an electronic copy. Why isn't that electronic copy posted for the general public? And Mr. Wool, you pointed out a perfect example early in the agenda on why that's required. If you're, if you're not the first one to provide the correct information, somebody else is gonna provide information that you have to then work to refute. If the information on the budget and all of those things are there for the public to view, that's where you're, you're directing them rather to some social media source that's providing maybe the only information that the public is going to see as it relates to the budget. Uh, I, before today, I actually, was under the impression that you had to wait till a caucus meeting was over before you formulated the budget. Uh, and again, that might just be air on my side, but if you knew at noon today what the, bud, what the agenda items were roughly going to look like, and you have a process where you have items that are on the agenda that may not be acted on, why wasn't that posted on Friday afternoon when the caucus checklist was printed? Uh, there's, there's just a, you know some things that I would help, I think, provide uh, information to the general public, especially in this era where uh, you, the social media posts and the incorrect information can be shared. I've made this request uh, several times. 
Uh, I think the last time 50% of the people that were on this board are, 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 you know, they're new tonight, but there's, there's an opportunity for us as a district to do more than the minimum. And certainly uh, that's where you are right now on what is posted for the public, but there's, a, there's an opportunity to do, do, do more, provide public information uh, and um, give more than nine people in the district the opportunity to see the detail that you're seeing and to help in that decision making. And you can direct then as a board member, well, here's where it's posted, go look it for yourself. Um, uh, there's an opportunity to do more and I would ask you to continue to review your process and procedures as you move forward. Thank you very much. Cheyenne Weibel, our department here with two students. My name is Andrew Lockard. I am the vice president of FFA. I'm McKenna Emig. I'm, the, I'm a sophomore of, and I'm the president of FFA this year. Um, I'm reaching out in support of the agriculture program at Bermudian, the district of Bermudian Springs occupies 75 square miles of Adams County. Rolling hills and beautiful orchards and farmland, Adams County is known for, known as the apple capital of the United States. It is home, um, and is home of brand, brand names like Lucky Leaf and Musselman's Main. Many area businesses are related to the agriculture industry. That being said, we are surrounded by agriculture. There are several ag classes uh, that all, many students go to and participate in. Many of them open the opportunity to join FFA. Um, some of the classes include Mechantech one, two, and three environmental awareness, animal science one and two, plant science and greenhouse, and ag business, of course. As a member of the FFA, the National FFA Organization is the largest student-based organization in the, in the country. The FFA provides Students to students the opportunity to grow into who they aspire to be. The FFA is important to offer to high school students because it molds students, teaches them how to fulfill goals and create bonds that will create a future for its students. Um, in my first year as a freshman FFA member, I had no idea what to expect in the FFA, yet I was challenged and excited to participate because I saw how much the organization had changed my brother and helped him. My freshman year had I had the opportunity to attend the FFA National Convention, which was a great experience for me. I also attended many conferences and competitions, which have taught me leadership skills, communication, and many, and also created many new friendships for me. These students are just here to talk about the opportunities and accomplishments that they've had in even just a short one year time frame. Um, I don't see many students um, that shine more than my FFA kids and try to get outside of their comfort zone to be able to stand in front of you guys to be able to tell them about the opportunities they have in the FFA. So they're just concerned about the overall outcome and hopes for the future of the Ag Department and the FFA. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, I just also want to thank you is that when I get to interact with people from other districts, I always brag big time on our FFA program uh, because it, it is one of the things that I think really makes makes Bermudian very unique uh, uh, is the strength of that program. So thank you. And thanks for all the hard work.
Hello, my name is Amy Leatherman and um, I'm here to do my shout outs again. Um, so I wanted to start with um, actually Mr. Peart. I just want to say you're doing an amazing job explaining the budget and to make it understandable. And as a school, we are very lucky to have you as our financial administrator. You're very thorough with everything and I appreciate you're always thinking ahead. Thank you, Mr. Peart for the incredible job you were doing for our district. Um, Mr. Carlson is an amazing music teacher. He encouraged my daughter to be a part of the musical. She did it and it was an awesome experience for her. She made new friends. She gained so much confidence. After performing in the musical, a light inside of her began to shine. She tried out for the Eagle Singers and gained so much confidence in her singing ability. I am thankful for Mr. Carlson, an amazing teacher. Uh, Mr. Morning is doing an incredible job with the STEAM camp. Uh, my son was very excited about his projects and he's learning critical thinking skills and he has to problem solve and use his creative skills to design his projects. These are great skills for Cade to be learning at his age and Mr. Morning is doing a fantastic job. Uh, Mr. Straub is a great teacher. My son had him in third grade. He really enjoyed having him and cannot wait to have him again in the middle school. As you can see, um, I highlighted um, the teachers that are the specials teachers. And as you're thinking about the budget and you're thinking about the cuts that you may have to make, the only way you can make them is through these programs. I know nobody wants to do that, but I don't know where you're gonna cut um, except from these programs. And as you can see, my kids are doing well because of these programs. And um, I just want you to think about that because you say about the cuts, but you're not really giving any real examples of where the cuts are gonna come from. And there's not many places they can come from except through music, athletics, um, FFA, and we don't wanna see that happen. And so thank you. <laughs> I got a big mouthful. Yeah, so I guess I was one of the people that got the information that we were aiming to shut down. Excuse me, can you, state your, can you state your name? Oh, I'm John Capula. I graduated in 2012. I had perfect attendance throughout. Um, All right. Thank you. But uh, yeah, I got the news that they were closing down vacational programming, so at least we were aiming for it. And uh, like I said on Facebook, I came across that vocational programs we're, we're going to be targeting. And uh, there was a guy named John Ward. And a lot of you guys know the guy. And I can tell you one thing. I'm a lead diesel mechanic at KBS right now because of that, man. And on our graduation day, he handed everybody $1. He said, this is the dollar I give you. The next dollar you'll earn. And I can't even tell you. Because of that vocational program, earning my green hand degree in agriculture, um, they paid for my college. They paid for me to go become a diesel tech. Um, and if it wasn't for that vocational program, because I didn't excel in math, I couldn't do math, but I could weld circles. You know what I mean? I could build engines. I could take something apart. I could put it back together. I, 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 I was heartbroken, you know, when I heard that we had to budget money in order to do that. Because if it wasn't for John Wardle, I wouldn't became who I became. If it wasn't because somebody believed in me, I wouldn't became who I became. My sister, Rachel Turner Diaz, I don't know if you've seen it on the news, but she just got a serious award. Um, she's a fish and game warden. And if it wasn't for vocational programming that she was in, she wouldn't be the first female officer to take that position. Um, so she's in charge of all the fish and wildlife in Adams County. Um, and so the things that I think you're impacting right now is so much bigger down the road. You know, like John Wardle, and I, I'm going to call him John Wardle because I look him as a friend. I don't look him as a teacher anymore because I still talk to the guy. Um, I'm sorry if anybody knows Mr. Wardle. But, uh, <laughs> but I looked to him as a friend, you know, and, and, and his core study was nothing about core study. I hate to throw him under the bus, but I remember the guy would bring his tax papers in. 
So I knew what Mr. Wardle made. I know what he, he was able to do. And he showed us his tax papers during ag business and he'd fill them out with us. And he shows how to do a W-2, how to do a W-4 and how to file your taxes. And that practical skills led into my success today. When he believed in me through public speaking, it led into who I am today. And, and like I said, because of that vocational program that we have here at Bermuda, it led to who I am today. You know, I literally bought a property in Bermuda just so my kids could have that same opportunity that I had. Um, so, I mean, I'm hoping that you guys don't cut the vocational programming, um, especially agriculture, arts, whatever, biology, because you don't see the bigger picture and what it makes that kid become. You know, I, I don't I don't use U.S. history every day. It's just not in, in my math, you know, but I do use some of the key concepts that I learned during agricultural business. I do use the key principles that I learned using what, what he taught me and how important that budget is. Because he'd go over a budget with us, you know, and he'd bring his bills in, he'd show us his bills. And I know I shouldn't say all this, but but he would, he, he would show us the practicality of everything. Like, this is what you're going to face in real life. This is real life stuff. And, you know, we kind of held it up there and, you know, kind of laughed at it. But I, I mean, even at 28 years old right now, I still hold that. I still hold that dollar that he had. And that was 12 years ago. That silver dollar he held gave me going across that stage. I still have it on my mantle in my new house. So, I mean, thank you guys. I just hope that we don't cut vocational programming for that that case thank you for sharing your story that was awesome hi i'm athena mcnulty and i just want to thank all of you we're here at 10 17 on a monday and i'm sure everyone is ready to go home but um I also wanna thank, I emailed each of you and I heard back from nine of you already, just a quick turnaround that you're responsive, just we're the small community where I can reach out to you and actually feel like I have a voice and you're listening to me. Um, and I hope you're listening to these people who are here tonight. We've heard from this FFA program, we've heard about the music program, we've heard about the VOTEC program. And like, obviously these people are giving testimony to these programs that, have made lifelong impacts or are in the midst of making lifelong impacts. And I just hope that you're not putting yourselves in the position to where you're having to listen to these as debates to decide what you're gonna have to cut and what you can keep. Uh, because it sounds like we're just in dire straits and that's just where we are. So I just hope that you make the right decision um, so that you don't have a mob of angry community members coming back, um, asking a lot of questions later when it's too late to do anything about it. So thank you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Chris Young. Um, I am. Um, had a student in the district, one just graduated in 2021. Uh, I manage the movie theater in Hanover and I'm also president of the Bermudian Sports Club. Uh, I throw that last bit out, not because I'm here advocating on their behalf, but just to throw out some credentials as to when I say I've seen things on the ground, I have seen things on the ground. I also substitute teach here. It's been one of the greatest years I've ever had. Um, what I would say is this, it, I think everybody in here can agree that what Bermudian Springs offers for the rather small school district that it is, is a humongous footprint for the opportunities for these kids. And I don't think anybody here, none of you, uh, have any desire to take any of those opportunities away. None of us do. We advocate the hardest for our children. The dilemma is this. We say all this, we don't want any, uh, we don't want anything to, to be denied our children. Yet by that same token, we are now based with a budget shortfall. And it really does not matter how we got here, okay? History can be useful as a roadmap and we should be wary of it, but you can't rewrite the map. We are stuck where we are right now. I'm sure if we could rewrite, how we've done any of us have how we've done our finances in the last three to five to 10 years. We'd all see where we are. Oh my God, why did I do this? Why did I do that? 
But those are what they are, and this is where we're at. If we do not allow for a tax increase, this is where you will be next year. Next May, next June, you will be sitting here, and you will be sitting there sweating the fact that no matter what, a program or two or three or four have to hit the chopping block. It won't happen this year. The concept of kicking the can down the road is what it is. But the fact is, is that I would like to say that I'm a bit of an optimist and I hope that in the interim, there are going to be some things that happen that may allow us, all right, to have a little bit of breathing room. I have a modest house. I have a modest income. I am like a modest person in this community when it comes to those things. What I will say, though, is I feel completely justified in saying that we all owe it to each other, to our students, to the faculty, to the staff, to the teachers and the administration to take on the same burden that we have been asking them to take on for the last two and a half years. The last two and a half years, we have asked our teachers and the administration to do things that they never, ever thought they would have to do. And yet right now, what we're saying is, it's likely that we might kick the can down the road, not to raise taxes, but to keep the status quo. And it's not keeping the status quo. It's actually taking a step backwards. We're not even going sideways. The idea is that we want to move forward. We want to be progressive with our education. We want the school district to grow. We want people to come into the community. So ask yourselves this. The minute that a program of substance gets cut in the arts, music, athletics, because those are things we can all sit here and say that they're mandatory, but they're not mandated, not in that way. The minute something like that gets cut, local news outlets are going to pick it up. What do you think happens with a prospective home buyer who's got two children, they want to come into this district? A simple Google search will show that programs at the local school, Bermudian, have been cut because of budgetary crisis. What happens if that's basketball? What happens if that is the musical? What happens if it's any number of things? It may not affect your children, but it will affect people. Why would you want to move into a community where you see what is happening, that things are getting cut? If no tax increase happens, we are dealing with double the next year. I recently went to Tennessee. I, uh, my mother had to have surgery and I took her to the hospital. And while I was in ICU with her, I walked outside to stretch my legs and I had these big letters that said, heroes work here. I, I looked at them, I was like, yeah, damn right, they do. And it occurred to me, heroes work here. I've seen it all year long. Heroes work here. They teach our students and they care for them. You cannot bind them by not providing them the financial well-being to be able to be successful. With that said, I will tell you again, seeing what I've seen here, substitute teaching, I, I, I packed up everything one day, tired, it was a long day. And uh, I saw the people that I see in suit and ties, taken, they had shed those off, they were in shorts and t-shirts and jeans and they were cleaning the classrooms. That's a true story. Everybody in this school district and I have been in all three buildings and I have talked to many parents, many students and many teachers and many administrators have had to wear multiple hats, especially in the last two and a half years. With that being said, now you're saying that if, it, if we do not meet this budget shortfall, we have to cut and slash more, but you don't want to take it from those programs. So you are going to force everything uh, on those people who have already been juggling what they've been juggling. You guys have a thankless job and I appreciate every ounce of energy and volunteerism that you put in. It is amazing to me that you will show up and you will stand up here and you know listen to everything that everybody has to say. And at the end of it, you'll maintain your optimism. And that is what I'm doing. I'm trying to maintain my optimism. But I will tell you that the detriment to the students, 
to the teachers, to the administration, by making arbitrary cuts, by saying this person can now do this, will have a, an immediate and real world impact and it will be far reaching. And what are we saying? We're okay with not raising taxes, but we are going to complain about the fact that we have $5 a gallon of gas. I'm really gonna complain about that while I'm filling up my car to go grab something to eat, go to the movies. Thank you, if you did go to the movies, by the way. You're gonna complain about that, yet what you are saying is that a moderate amount of money that you have to pay per month is not acceptable when we know that that money goes specifically to the school. It's not to a random road someplace out in the boondocks. It is to this school. It's to these kids here. I've watched these kids all year long, and it is amazing that this tiny rural school has the footprint that it does, and it has the variety and the opportunity it does. Those will start to diminish. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. If you do not raise the taxes, in the end, what is going to happen is the victims will be the children. The school is the heart of this community. Don't diminish it. Please don't. I have a moderate income. I don't want to pay more taxes. Who does? But I know that if I do pay more, it goes to this school. It goes to this district. It does not go anywhere else. And because of that, I reside peacefully in the fact that we will be providing our children with the best possible opportunity that we can. To not do so and to say that it's burdening this family and that family, I understand that. We are all burdened right now. What do you think will happen? We have inflation. It's going to be followed by a recession. So next year, you will be sitting here at this time, possibly in a recession, saying, oh, we've got to raise taxes and cut programs. Please don't. If you cut programs and raise taxes next year, I guarantee the popularity decline that you might suffer now from a moderate tax increase will be terrible next year. Please don't diminish the ability of this school to grow. Let's move forward. Please, let's not move back. Thank you so much for your time. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you for your time. Okay. Um... At this time, we're going to have to go back into executive session because we ran out of time before the meeting.